Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. Uh, I am one of your hosts, David Farkas. I'm joined by Josh Lair. Hello, everyone. We've got uh, Jose Rivera producing the show as always and keeping an eye on your comments. Hello, guys. So, today, yes, we are starting the kickoff episode of our Gearing Up For series. Yes, this and, should be uh, yeah. a three, possibly more part How, series. However many it takes. <laughs> That's right. If you guys know us, you know that we tend to be very in-depth. So, thorough, thorough, thorough. thorough yeah. So today, so what is today's theme, Mr. Fergus? So we're kind of lumping two things together because they're pretty closely mm -hmm. related when mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. how to build out a kit for one or the other. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about travel photography and street photography. Yes. But now when we say travel photography, mm -hmm. I think it's important to mention that our next episode, which was originally planned to be this one, yes. but because we really want to make it excellent, we pushed it back, is going to be gearing up for landscape. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to talk about landscape photography tonight. Tonight's going to right. be about, the way I like to describe it is, the kind of photography we're going to talk about tonight is where 95% of it will be handheld. I like that. There'll be some tripod discussion, sure. but that's going to be almost secondary. Right. Whereas in two weeks, our landscape photography episode mm -hmm. will be 95% of photography <laughs> on a tripod and right, right, some right, little right. bit handheld. So yeah, think sure. about that when you're thinking about the kinds of questions, because that's what we'll be talking about um, tonight. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a lot of history mm -hmm. behind street photography and Leica. Definitely. And it used to be just the M system. Of course, now we're lucky to have quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think... Um, I almost knocked something over. <laughs> I didn't, though. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of questions. I'm imagining from mm -hmm. everyone, and we're encouraging uh, you guys to check it out. Did you put some stuff in the comp in the um, description as well? Oh, did I? <laughs> oh, uh, did I? Yes. Yeah, so stuff we may not even have a chance to talk about, but just in case, we brought a lot of different things. And just so we can you know, make it as easy for you guys, I've got tons of links down in the comments um, of, or the video description, rather, where you can, and everything's kind of categorized but by camera equipment, by computer things, by weather things, by whatever. Um, so go and check those out. If there's something we talk about and we say we've got it down in the comments, check the comments. Yeah, or not the there, comments, the description. Yes, yeah, so the description. I know, it's, I, I do the same thing. But it's in the description of the video. We've got a lot of links. And if uh -huh. there's something you don't see, um, Jose or David can pop it into the yeah. chat. Yeah, and, well. and some people have said in the past they've had issues finding where that is. Mm. So if you're actually watching YouTube live on your on your phone, I believe you actually click on the video title. So it would okay. say you know Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. If you click on that, there's a tiny little down arrow, and it'll expand the video description, and then just scroll through that, and you'll see all the links. Yeah, because there's so much cool stuff. And again, if you've watched any episode with either David or I. Um, you yeah. know we love gadgets and gizmos and toys and all the ancillary goodies, of which only some are on the table and the rest are scattered around. Yeah, they actually did not have room. <laughs> scattered yeah. around the studio <laughs> tonight. But, you know, we're dedicated to trying to give everybody the range of what's available for mm -hmm. this kind of photography. David and I have both done workshops for this kind of stuff, and we've shot of this stuff ourselves, and we've been around people who we are motivated, inspired by, mm -hmm. and... There's so much to discuss. We should probably just dive right in. Yeah, I, I, I love I love travel photography. Yes, it's, it's one yeah. of like my favorite favorite types. Um, so if if people ask me what kind of pho photographer are you, first they say, "Do you shoot weddings?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> not like no." Yeah. And ironically, not even if you pay me. Um, I like travel photography and I like landscape photography. So this is this is certainly near and dear to my heart. And yes. I know Josh, you know. Loves to travel, loves to take yeah. pictures while traveling. A lot traveling. of walk-around shooting I like yeah. to do, like really just having the camera with me. Mm -hmm. I don't do as much landscape as I used to, right. unless we're out together, and then right, yes. Right, right. Um, a lot of car photography for me, which is, I don't know where that would fit. Maybe that'll be an episode for next year, but um, <laughs> <laughs> not not today. We do uh, uh, cars, watches, and uh Yes, and and dogs, and dog dogs, dogs, yeah, but right. The, but the beauty of street and travel photography, it is, essentially encourages you to photograph your environment. Mm -hmm. We say travel, you don't really have to actually travel to do this kind of work. I mean, as long as you travel out of your front door. Exactly. You're right. You have to do some amount of travel. But you right, don't have right, to go right. far. You can't still so, be in bed and do travel. So stuff. a lot of what David and I will talk about, and maybe he'll show images, will be exotic locations and all mm -hmm. over the world. But the reality is 
our goal tonight, I think, is to get you guys and girls ex- uh, inspired. Yeah. To not just go to Patagonia and photograph, but mm-hmm. walk out your front door and just see the world in a different way. I mean, I think you you touched on this that Leica has a long heritage of this. Yes. And it's not just, you know, we we kind of bundle in street photography, but Leica in the in the old sense used to call this you know, reportage. Mm. In modern day, we call it documentary photography. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But really, if you look at travel photography, street photography, reportage, documentary, it's all the same thing. We're just trying to capture the essence or the flavor or that moment in time and and capture that for whatever future posterity, yeah. you know, and artistic. But, you know, what we may look at where, oh, it's a you know, it's a strip mall parking lot with right. like a Prius. You're right. like, oh, I don't want to shoot that. That's not timeless. But if you look back at, you know, at, at classic photographs from, you know, the, the 1950s and 60s, they were contemporary photographs. It's their classic now. Right. In hindsight. In yeah. hindsight. Yeah. But at the time, they were just yeah. documenting what was around them. And I think part of the fun of all the gear, which again, which is kind of our thing, yeah. is it does allow you as a tool to create images and document your surroundings in different ways. Yeah. So we'll talk about that tonight, is about how to use all of these tools and then some to get that result, to get yourself inspired, motivated, and out and about photographing. Uh, We've got a lot of questions that were submitted ahead of time, which again, I encourage everyone to do. We always ask for questions ahead of time and we don't get nearly as much as we get in the chat. Right. So if you have a burning question that you, after you see us post our next, um, you know, live, whatever you want to call it, thumbnail, um, you can ask us ahead of time, and that pretty much guarantees it'll get answered because we always review those beforehand. So just a little housekeeping tip. But why don't we dive in? Before I have Jose check the uh, ahead of time questions, anything burning in the chat right up front that we want to jump on or what? Uh, I don't think so. Nope, I just feel greetings like we missed, from everywhere. We missed the early Hi one. So. to everyone. Hello to everyone from everywhere. We love. <laughs> we are very grateful that you have joined us today. Hello, everywhere. That's Thanks right. Thanks for having us. We are here yeah. in sunny, dark South Florida. Internet. Um, Internet. Excellent. All right. Well, Jose, why don't you pick something for us? All right. Let's get started. Is a 28 millimeter or 35 millimeter better for street shooting? Mm, that's a good question. Sure. What, what do you think? Personally, I think they can both work. I tend to prefer 35 because mm-hmm. it's a very natural focal length. Mm-hmm. But, you know, based on the kind of pictures that I'm looking to make or the feel. And we've talked about this, I think, in our wide angle episode specifically, Mm -hmm. which was the wider you are, the closer you need to be to your subject. So if you're going to shoot with a 28, like the Q, you know, you want to be at that distance of, you know, almost being able to put your hand on that person's shoulder. That's kind of the working distance that you want to be thinking about. Yeah. With 35, you can be a little further back. It just gives you more breathing room. But having the wider lens is going to make it feel that you're a participant in the image Mm. and the longer the 35 still is a participant because it's still technically a wide angle yes but you know let's say we go to 50 90 really step it back then you become almost just an outside observer so as we get deeper into that wide angle range like a 28 um or 21 even i mean i know people shoot 21 sure but i think 28 for most people is going to be the ideal street focal length. I think the other or the main reason that 28 traditionally is so popular for shooting street photography is not just because of the engagement encourages from the photographer and subject, but also because at least during the day when you're shooting at f8 or f11, you have that much more depth of field with a 28. Yeah. So for True. scale focusing or shooting from the hip or whatever kind of work like that when you're not actually physically focusing for each picture it's a little bit easier because you do have more mm-hmm. fudge factor you have more depth of field um which is why you could even use a 21 or a 24 especially as we have cameras like the m10 monochrome that are so high resolution mm-hmm. you can cheat it a little bit and shoot with a 24 when you may have used a 28 yeah to take advantage of that increased depth of field and then True. i don't always encourage cropping later but especially if you're learning right it could be a fun way to do that now that we have so much resolution yeah, and, and I think also when we're talking just about street photography, I think that you don't have to think in terms of the most resolution possible. Right. So having, you know, 20 or 24 really good megapixel. A lot of people are still using M9. Sure. And M9 monochrome at 18, and it's plenty. Yeah. 
I mean, you and I have both seen gallery images uh, shot by amazing street photographers from 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, all shot on film and like really grainy film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And blown up wall size and yeah. they still hold up. I think that's a great point because there's a major, major, um, I don't want to call it a standard difference, but if you were to prioritize the metrics of what matters in an image, landscape photography and street photography, those lists are different. Yes, they are. If your landscape photo is a little soft or a little overexposed or a little grainy, it's going to be really obvious and it'll seem like you made a mistake or your technique wasn't good. If your street photo is a little grainy or a little blurry, that's just part of that process because of the inherent fluid and ever-changing and rapid-fire nature of photographing out in public, whether it's a busy place or not, there's a certain understanding that it's just not going to look the same as a tripod-mounted F8 cable release landscape photo. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it, there's so much more emotion that goes into that kind of work or a different kind that's sort of more forgiving, I mm -hmm. guess we can call it that. So that's, you know, especially if you're learning rangefinder or whatever, learning how to photograph on the street, keep that in mind. Like, don't think, oh, it's a little soft. If it's a great moment, if it's a great scene, it's a good picture. Even if it's a little out of focus, I think it's okay. I'm saying that. It's blasphemous. But... Okay. No? Next question. Well, I'm going to... Oh, wait. I'm going to just read a comment okay. uh, from, from Lawrence here, which okay. I think co comes in great into our conversation, which is, he says, the 28 gives you more context in the image while giving you the immediacy of the moment, the essence of street photography. Absolutely. Because, again, it's, it forces you to get closer because you can't have... A person 30 feet away with no. a 28, they're going to look no. like a little tiny ant person. So you got to be really, as David said, almost at shoulder touch mm -hmm. length, or depending on what your objective is. Right. Uh, but yeah, it definitely encourages you to get in on it, get in on the action, which is good, can be fun. Mm -hmm. That was a good comment, Lawrence. Um, any other? Oh, there's so many questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, they just started <laughs> flooding in now. Uh, where it's dumping snow, TJ, it's snowing there. Snowing. I it's... don't know. It's such a this phenomenon. Our our stuff that falls from the sky is very wet. Yeah, but it's not very cold. No, it's not very cold. Um, um, what else we got up there? Okay, so... There's a lot of things. Well, Subash's questions. Yeah, well, there, right? let, let's go to Jose. I'm going to just read through a couple of these while you okay, pick yeah. out something well, for I'll, us. You read through a few of those. Let yep. me, give, me one, give me one here, Jose. What do you got? Sure. Um, what, is good, what is a good set of lenses on an M for travel? 28, 50, 90, 21, 35, and 75. Oh, that's Subash's question, yep, right? Yep. So Subash asked this, what is a good set of lenses and then 20, 50, 90? Well, I think when you're going somewhere with the intent of photographing, you generally have some itinerary or some idea of what you're going to be faced with. So I try to think of the extremes and I build my kit around that. So mm -hmm. if I'm going somewhere where I know I'll be doing a lot of interiors or epic streets like streetscape not street photo but streetscape shots mm -hmm. i would go towards the wider side i'd probably have a 21 and what was the other 30, 35 70 so the, the yeah. second kit 21 mm -hmm. 35 75 if i know i'm going to have a lot more people or i'll be doing a lot more documentary type work and less architecture landscape streetscape kind of stuff i'll go with this the first kit which is 28 50 90 mm -hmm. because a 75 i can do portrait type stuff with it and walk around but if I know I'm going to be doing a lot of people or a lot of close-up work, I'd rather have an ID. So it is, it's not just one rule or another. It is thinking about your intent yeah. and then kind of putting your kit together around some of the extremes or some of what you know you're going to be doing a lot of, especially if you're doing a workshop with a photographer who shoots a certain way and you know will encourage you to do that. Right. Um, that's what I would say to that. I mean, and my answer is yes to both. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I probably mentioned this previously in, in M episodes, but I use a hybrid approach. So I really like 90, I really like 35, but I also really like 50, and I like something a little wider than 28. So I use kind of this split hybrid approach, which is where I'll take a um, an 18, which we can't get anymore, but that's a separate story, 18, <laughs> yeah. 24, 35, 50, 90. Now that's the full kit at, okay. that I I won't always take all of that with me. Usually I'm just going to be working from 24 to 90. And the and like Josh says, you kind of know what your itinerary is for that time. Right. right. So if you imagine um, if I'm not going to be doing any interiors, if I'm just going to be out wandering around, 
then I'll leave the 18 behind. Yeah. You know, and then I'm just 25, 35, which is the... 25? 24. <laughs> is there a new 25 millimeter? 20... No, you're not supposed to tell them <laughs> oh, that. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, 24, 35 at kind of that one half and then uh, 50 and 90. So I'm using two halves of that scenario. There's no rule that says you have to shoot right. 21, 35, 75. Right. If you want, you could shoot 21, 35, 90. Sure. Uh, it's all what works for your photography and where you're going. Absolutely. There's because so many it, options. Yes, the destination have, yeah. so, really can dictate um, the, the kind of lenses you want to take. But this is also a good um, sort of opportunity to talk about learning your kit. What I mean is you don't just pick a lens for the sake of it. As you begin to use your lenses, you understand the feel that they give, the compression, the bokeh, or lack thereof, what kind of subject matter you end up shooting with that lens, and mm -hmm. you can work backwards on that. I mean, that takes time. Yeah. But as you learn your gear, you have a better sense of how to properly kit out for different situations that you may occur. Um, next question. Sure. We spent too much time with that. Oh, <laughs> I think that's a good question. <laughs> that was a great question. It was a great question. These are really good questions that require in-depth answers. I like it. Anything in the chat? Oh, let me ask you this one. Yep. Um, Nelson asks, if you can only take, forgive me, I'm looking at the computer screen. Um, if you can only take one lens for travel mm -hmm. and you'll be shooting anywhere from landscape to street photography to portrait, okay, which lens do you take? I know his answer, but go ahead. Uh, I gotta find it. Where is it? What are you looking for? You know what I'm looking for. Right, right here? Over there. Here? Is it the other side of that? No. Uh, up there. Oh, the FLE? No. Um, <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my gosh, they all look the same. Cameras, yeah. This, I would take this. Uh, this is the 35 1.4 FLE. Uh, this, is, this is my desert island lens. Yeah, we talked about this a lot, so we don't want to beat a dead horse right. too much, but I agree with David. 3514 floating element, the current version of yep. the 35 Sumalox comes in black or silver, is like it's the first 35 that I found that I can shoot portraits with Absolutely. pretty confidently because uh, and, 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 and get that look because it's at the 1.4. Yep. Um it's ridiculously sharp, so it's perfect for landscape. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one you were doing? Street and for street, it's a 35. That's so great. You, can, you can shoot street with a 35, and it's not massive. Nope. Especially if you watch the last episode where I talked about taking the hood off and using the finishing ring. Yeah. Same concept where you can make it even smaller and more yeah. discreet. Because the hood, I will say the metal hood can look a little professional. Yeah, so, but look how small yeah, that is. Now that, that becomes much less obvious. So that's a tip for that. So yeah, 3514 FLE. If I could only have one lens on M, it would probably be that. Um, in terms of like, I'd have to do as much different kinds of photography with it. Um, it's very possible. it's very flexible. And we agree. We almost never agree, but we agree on that. Uh, which We're going to have something. to disagree about disagreeing today. Yes, exactly yeah. right. Um, Let's agree to agree. That was a good question, though. Uh, let me just see what else is here that I can ask you. Oh, um, okay. Richards? Okay. Yeah. Richard asks, this is a great question. Yep. Very, um, very. I will give David the tool that we, yeah, he's going to need to answer <laughs> and this, it. And, this. and that. Richard asks, what is best practice for avoiding dust on your sensor when traveling and changing lenses? Do you watch for it and clean it in the field? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go. Yes. Uh, dust is a reality of digital cameras. Leica has put measures in place, let's say on the M10, where they've actually moved the cover glass further away from the sensor so that the, the dust actually won't resolve on the sensor as evidently at normal apertures. You'll see it if you stop down to F16. Right. And you'll see it in blue skies. But in normal situations uh, for general travel and street photography, you won't see it as much as other cameras um, like the S is or the SL, where the the mech, the sensor cover glass is closer. So, yes, you're going to get dust. Everyone's going to get dust. The only way not to do that is to never change your lens. And even that is not good enough because the connection between the M body and the M lens is not sealed, weather sealed. Mm -hmm. There's no gasketing like there is on the S or the SL. So, being in a dusty environment or simply the act of turning the focus ring and drawing some air in. Mm -hmm. Even if you never change lenses, you can still get dust on your sensor. I would say, especially the the floating lens element designs, the FLEs, like the 3514 that we spoke about, the 50 APO, 75 APO. the 75 APO, yeah. uh, they actually have quite a d good deal of suction when you're changing focus, and they can draw dust inside. Don't avoid those lenses because of that. <laughs> They're amazing lenses. We have a fix. But the fix is, yes, I do address uh, dust in the field, Part of this is making sure that you stay on top of downloading your images on a daily basis. 
So I like as a, as a safety progression too, both for data safety as well as actual like somebody taking my camera safety because I can replace a camera with insurance. It might be unfun, but it can be replaced. It's a thing, okay? Things can be replaced. The problem is I don't want to lose all those pictures that I've been that I can only capture that one time because they only happened that one moment that you captured. So the pictures are very sacred to me and I wanna make sure that if something happens, if it gets left in the back of a cab or if you know I forget it in a cafe and it disappears, whatever it is, um, I wanna make sure that I have the least amount of image loss. So you should always be downloading your images as you go. And when you're doing that, make sure to spot check that everything is functioning well with your camera and make sure that if you have some really ugly dust or a filament or something on your sensor, that's the time to address it. It's not when you're walking around in a busy city. The time to address it is when you're sitting in a hotel room, you know, looking at your images and say, oh my gosh, there is a little squiggly in half of my images in the sky. And at that time, what you want to use is I use a two, two pronged approach here, right? So prong one is the a little rocket blower bulb. I'm going to close up there. There we go. Okay. And it doesn't weigh anything because it's hollow and it's made of rubber and plastic. But basically, let me grab the M here. Uh, so to clean an M camera, you do have to go into a sensor cleaning mode. Okay. And in the main menu. Oh. We're gonna get in trouble. That's I think that the engine R. No, it still has this. It's so new. It still has the. Um, oh, it's just screen the plastic. Protect, yeah, screen yeah, protector yeah. on there. That's the factory screen protector. But they can, we can still see it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. And there we there. go. Okay. Beautiful. So if you scroll down in the main menu, eventually, to what's image numbering sensor cleaning. Push. You went the wrong way. I went the wrong way. <laughs> it's, it's, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I'm glad it's not just me who does no, that. No, Why no. Why don't you go to it and then turn the camera around? Here it's we the go. second to last item in the main menu. It's on the last page with camera information. It's called sensor cleaning. Okay. There it is. Sensor cleaning. Okay. And we're going to do open shutter. Inspect sensor. Yes. Okay. Got to take the lens off. Buddy. Please switch off after inspection. We're going to take the lens off. There we and go. you can see. There she is. There's the sensor, okay? So what I'll do just visually, is there anything big on the sensor? Is there a filament? If not, or if there is, you know? And you normally want to do this upside down. Yeah, to um, get yeah, whatever. Like that. Yeah, I, it's, it's just they can't see that way. Yeah, yeah, it's just hard to show on so camera. So pretend this is actually that, that there, way. Yeah, yeah, just like that. Okay, yeah. and we're blowing it out like that. And just try to move it around. But do not stick this onto your sensor. That would be bad. That would be very bad. So just kind of keep a safe distance, blow it around, blow it around. Yeah. We okay. Got and you put your lens back on. Now, hopefully, that should resolve any kind of visible uh, issue that you might have. If it doesn't, and you have some stubborn, stubborn, sticky dust, that's when you break out the bigger gun, which is this. This is called an eye lead sensor cleaning stick. Okay, and it looks like a little blue jelly thing on a stick. Inside are a bunch of papers. Okay, and the paper peels back, if I can. They usually peel back. I want to do that. That might have been a used one. I don't know. That looks like a used one. Are no, they all used? Just, no, they're just hard to, it's just hard to, you want to do it? There we go, I got oh, it. Oh, you got it, okay. Okay, so you peel it back right here, like so. Of course, you have to take this. You have to open this. So try to. This, try is, to my, this is my eye lead, not yours, yeah. David. So don't mess it up. Try to do one at a <laughs> I time. Use this okay. Every day. So you want to expose the little gummy, and we're gonna peel this back. So it's kind of like flypaper, if you will, and one side is sticky, and the other side is just wax paper. And usually you would do this on a table. I'll actually use the camera because it gets me the right height here. There we go. I don't say you have to do this on your camera. Usually I would do it on a clean table, clean surface. And you want to do this motion here. Okay, and that's going to do it just about two times. So the first time is going to get whatever dust on the sensor stick off the sensor stick. And then the second one's going to basically recharge it. Now it's sticky. That same motion that I just did, I'm not going to actually do this on this camera on air, but uh, what you do is you take the little stick, 
you push it down with that motion and off the sensor. So do not do this. That's a no. Don't do that. Gently roll it on. Gently roll it off. Roll it on, roll it off, and then keep recharging it and cleaning it between applications. Usually, uh, you'll be able to see those stubborn dust on there. And this is what you want to use that for. So it's not to clean the whole sensor off. It's to clean the stubborn dust that won't come off with the blower bulb. That being said, option number two still may not work. And at that point, don't mess with it. Um, keep shooting. Try to work around it. It's really easy to spot if you just have a couple pieces of dust to just hit them in Lightroom. It's really easy. Uh, and then you can send it to Leica for a, a cleaning, or you can have it cleaned locally by a professional camera cleaning service that you trust. And that's kind of the, the theory. But the answer is, of course, you want to make sure to create uh, the least amount of work in post-processing that you can yeah. by cleaning yourself. The reality is that unless you're shooting like past f8 or the really wide angle lens, you're you're not going to see a lot of it, even if there is a lot of dust, especially if you're photographing busy scenes like cityscapes, things like that. Thank you. Um, really only for landscape type of stuff is where it's more noticeable or if you're stopped way down. And of course, the traditional way M lenses are used is at or near wide open aperture. So yeah, it's actually not. Right. Know. So so dust, what Josh is saying, just to reiterate, is dust becomes a lot more visible as you stop down. So for landscape photography, where you're shooting at f11, and you have a lot of sky, you're going to see it in those areas. Um, and you can we'll only, talk about that next. And you can only do this, of course, on cameras that change lenses to answer it. Right. Um, something like the Q, Q2, if somehow it gets dust on the sensor, it's got to go back to customer care. Uh, I'd like that to be cleaned. But it's not as much yeah. of an issue on those way cameras. Way less of an issue. Right. And there's no way to fully prevent it. Like, don't live your life in fear of sensor dust. Don't feel like you have to be in this plastic bag to change lenses. You just want to be careful, have common sense. And like David was saying, you check your images when you're downloading, you do a spot check, see if there's dust and you take care of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the world's not gonna end um, if you have some dust and you have the right tools at your disposal and you can take take it away. Mm -hmm. Easy. Yeah. Anything good in the chat? Let's see. Regarding dust, should you always turn off the camera when, when changing lenses? No. Nah. I mean- I don't do it. Well, not on the M's, I don't do only it. Only if you have the S adapter on the SL. Yeah, yeah I do it with the SL um, just because there's no shutter in front, mm -hmm. but with the M's, because the shutter is always there, you just don't want to have live view turned on. Right. Although it should, it does it doesn't. Um, turn off live view when you take the lens off, I think, depending on the lens. So yeah, turn off live view, but you the camera for an M camera can be on. It's okay. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> wow, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, let me well. think. Uh, Tamer, your question with differences in the 21 and 24, I, if you haven't watched our wide angle video, you should definitely do that. We spent two hours basically talking about that. Um, so just in case we don't get to it tonight, which we may or may not. Uh, how about the x -Vario? Hey, I used to use Tim, the x -Vario. Tim, David, Tim asked that question. Thank you, Tim. Um, for daytime shooting, awesome. It's a great lens and a great sensor. 28 to 70? Um, yeah. But not for nighttime shooting. It's a little bit slow for that. Yeah, it's kind of maxes out around sixteen hundred. Yeah, yeah, but thirty two hundred. Yeah, daytime most. stuff, and it's a good. They're good deals now, and it's you know made in Germany, real mm -hmm, German, mm -hmm. like a lens. I mean, it's pretty nice. But if you like the X Vario, you would love the CL with mm. an eighteen to fifty six. Very true, because it's basically the modern iteration of that. That's yes. what that's what the X Vario became. Yeah, so true. Which we did an episode about the CL on that. We did, watch that. and we'll probably talk more about it tonight. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, so what, two people want to know, when's the last time you shot with a film like it? Oh, geez. Like for serious? Ah, oh, years. Um, for, for fun? I, I mean, I test some of the film bodies we get, mostly just around town. But our colleagues, Kirsten yeah. carries an M4 as part of her regular travel kit. Yeah, and along, Ashlyn. And Ashlyn yeah. also yeah. shoots film. So, so we she may actually not, shoots a lot of film. But our, some of our colleagues do. So yeah. I feel yeah. that I have shot enough film for a lifetime <laughs> That I'm I'm done. And so you you know when in college we had to shoot uh, four by five slides and then show the slide in critique <laughs> on a light table. We're not even allowed to edit them or scan right, them right. or anything. So after you've done you've suffered through that, you never want to shoot film again. <laughs> At least for me, yeah. I think analog M is pretty fun. It's the only film that I would ever shoot. I wouldn't shoot 120 anymore probably personally just because it's a little too much work. But since I can use an analog M exactly like I use a digital M, the mechanics are the same. You know, it's pretty natural. Ooh. Oh, I got? like that. That's a good one. EMDBLC. 
uh, this is the this is the loaded question you just asked. <laughs> I'm going to ask David this question: Travel light or be fully prepared? In five words or less, David, go. Uh, bring <laughs> all the things. Uh, my that's my mantra. I would much rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That being said, I do believe in traveling as light as possible for the type of photography that I'm doing. So for travel. That's why I gravitate towards either a CL kit or an M kit, because they are the lightest while being able to bring as many options as I can. So that, I think, answers the question. And I think you can never truly be fully prepared because you may be photographing and have every single lens for street shooting possible, and then like some random like rare bird, rare or something. bird <laughs> fly, you know, an eight hundred. Like it's you know you're not going to do it all. So I think the objective needs to be to be as prepared as you can be within the boundaries of your budget sure, and sure. your kit and your capability. So, you know, yes, of course, you should have one of every lens with you from 16 all the way to right. 135. But, uh, but, it's not always but definitely for, for travel, mm. I do, I kind of have an, I have an unofficial rule for myself, which is the 10 pound rule, which is, and I'm sorry for all the people that don't live in the United States. What is that in kilos? <laughs> like four, four like and four, a half kilos. Yeah, yeah. Like four something, four points something kilos. Yeah is my rule, which is whatever I pack, that bag, everything that fits in that bag needs to weigh less than 10 pounds because that's... For a travel kit. For travel. Not because his S bag is 60 pounds. So let's... <laughs> uh, 40. It's oh, like 40. so sorry. Yeah. It's a so small for, child. For travel, I want to actually enjoy traveling. I want to enjoy exploring a place. Um, and that means I don't want to be miserable carrying something really heavy. Uh, at least when I'm doing landscape, I'm prepared for that. I'm, you know, outfitted with more comfortable hiking boots and I've got a really big backpack. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be trudging that around a city. So I want to go to a small shoulder bag um, or even a case if I'm carrying a Q2, no shoulder bag, you know, and then I can just be pretty free. Uh, so so even I who say be, be prepared, be prepared within that limitation and where that point of comfort is, is going to be pretty individual. Some people might not want to carry more than five pounds and that's their rule. Yeah. And everyone's different. But for me, I, I feel that if I have a bag that fully loaded with the camera and everything in it is 10 pounds, once I remove the M, let's say an M10 and this lens, that's three pounds. So now I'm only carrying like seven pounds in my bag at most. Yeah. yeah. And that's a lot more comfortable. I like that philosophy. I think like David saying, you know, no matter how much gear you have, if you don't want to bring it with you in the environment you're going to, if you know you're going to be walking around a city all day long, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter how good it is or how yeah. capable the gear is, you you don't have it. So right. you have to balance that out. Um, when we talk about our landscape photography, it's a different ballgame, like David's saying. Bring we've everything. Boots on, we've got backpacks <laughs> with frames, and like we're going nuts. <laughs> but you're not going to do that in the city. I mean, you yeah. might. <laughs> you may look that kind of funny. Um, but, you know, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, what and, else we got? What? And, and just to add on, one more thing on that is I have broken the rule on occasion. So let's say I'm just thinking back uh, when I was in Florence, Italy, I broke the rule. I brought a small travel tripod and a 180 millimeter R lens in my bag for my, at the time, M240. Because I knew that I wanted to get one shot from the top of Piazza de Michelangelo, whatever, at the like overlooking the city. The forecast was for an amazing sunset, and I knew I wasn't going to be going back to my hotel. I'd be out walking all day, so either I carried it with me or I didn't have it, and I sh and I suffered through that extra five <laughs> pounds, yeah. which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot when you're walking around all day and uphill. But I was really glad that I had it because I got an epic shot that I wouldn't have had if I, you know, wimped out and left it back in my hotel. There we go. So. Rules, but break them when you want I mean, to. yeah, the objective in the end is to make good pictures. Yeah. So you do what you got to do yeah. to do that. But, you know, we try to give you some framework to go off of here. I'm going to ask you that. Uh, you want to ask me that? Yeah. Yeah, that's an easy one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Nick says, I've got the TL23, which is a great lens, mm -hmm. and a Q2. Mm. That's good. Uh, is the 35 crop on the Q2 better than the 23 TL on, I'm assuming, either a TL or a CL, yeah. too. Well, 
I would say no, to be honest. Even though it's slightly higher resolution, 30 megapixels versus 24, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the look of a 35. So if your objective is simply to get the field of view of a 35, well, obviously the Q2 can get it done. Mm -hmm. But if you want a picture that looks like it was taken with a 35, then no, you need to have a 23. Um, I could argue either way, to be honest with you. I've shot a lot with both. We'll probably talk about this later, sort of the CL, TL2 versus Q2 mm -hmm. argument. The Q2 can do a lot. And if you only can bring one camera, I'm kind of leaning towards the Q2 a lot of the time. But again, it does depend on my objectives. If I know I'm going to need 16 millimeters, I'm not going to bring the Q2. If I know I'm going to need 180 millimeters, I'm not going to bring the Q2. Whereas on the CL, I could use the 11 23 I could use the 55 the 135 I could yeah. use all the other things, or the, or the TL2. Um, so it does depend on my ultimate objectives, but I think just apples to apples, they're going to be close, but there are, there are outside variables that would determine exactly which one of those two I would use beyond is one just better. Because I think if you shot them next to each other and made a brand, you probably wouldn't be able to tell be much close. of a difference practically. Well, and I think that says a lot to both both yes. the, I mean, here's the 23, just to give in a, a actually, this is both of your options yeah, are right, right there. here. Look we, at that. We get a close up on the, these two bad boys. I'm just flipping them upside down okay. and the inside here out. Here we go. There we go. So that's the CL with the 23 and a thumb support and the Q2 with, it's of course, it's 28. So they're, you know, the CL's a bit smaller, even with the grip on there. Um, so I, again, I, the Q2 is incredibly powerful and I don't want to understate that, but there's something about the ability to change lenses and use M lenses that you get with the TL2 or the CL that you don't get with the Q2. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, it's, you can't go wrong. And if, if that's the choice you have to make in the morning, then yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's not bad. <laughs> Q2 or CL, you know, cause we shoot with both. Um, yeah. Good question though. I'd actually keep it fresh, shake it up. Take one out one day, take another out the other there day. There you go. Or I'd bring the Q2 and then the CL or the TL2 with the 60 macro. Ooh. Have two totally different I like that. options. Even together, those that's a pretty light kit. Very. Yeah. And you could sling them over your shoulder if you really wanted to mm -hmm. and not bring a bag. Or you get an original Q with this 28 and then it has the same battery as the CL. And you can be <laughs> really, because you only have to bring one charger. Like, yeah, you can. Yeah, I like that. that. I like that. Um, um, what else we got in there? Okay. Any Let's questions see. I can ask you? Let's see. Let me go down. Can you go to the bottom. Mm. Oh, well, the bad question is we should probably, we really. Oh, I see us. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we're back. Are we back? Somebody say something. <laughs> oh, man. Let's see. Are we back? Are we back? Are we back? Are we back? Uh, Maybe. Um, oh, no, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Uh oh. Did he get like, caught up or something? Yeah, it has to catch up. Okay. What was the problem, OBS? Yes. Yep. Okay. I think we're good. That's not good. Well, I wouldn't be watching either if there wasn't anything on. They're back. They're going to find us. Hopefully, you guys see us. Somebody say something. We're going to give like another minute just to make sure everybody gets caught, caught up. Oh, it says it's a little choppy. So I think yeah. we're having a connectivity issue here. Hey, it's free. Okay. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, not smooth. Boy. All right, guys. Just a sec. I think it's laggy because it's catching up, but we'll see. Oh, perfect. Choppy. Okay. Uh, Julie says she sees and hears us now. Okay. I'm just communicating with some colleagues here. Trying to find out. Hopefully everybody had a crust and a coffee and a, we're going to go again. Oh, I guess it wouldn't be another episode without some catastrophic failure. Another meteor. Yeah, that's what it must have been. The other another meteor. It was the, it was the same meteor came back around, full orbit. Yep, took us out. Yep, 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 yep. All right, hold up here. Still choppy. Very choppy. Okay.
All right, Jose, what do you see? Or just say something in the comments too so that they know we're working. Well, they say the sound is fine, that the video is lagging. No. Oh. No, who needs to see us? You can just hear us. Oh, the dog is okay. He survived the <laughs> It's the second meteor strike. Oh boy. We need to just we need to just go on regular television. Like just on cable. It's like we're like a cable access. Cable show. access yeah. like Wayne's World. I think we need to do that. <laughs> I think that would solve all of our problems. Then you could just grin uh, it Okay, so yeah, people say it's not it's not improving, it's very choppy. Hold, please. We're gonna get it. We're gonna fix it. It's okay. Uh... <laughs> it wouldn't be fun if it was easy and normal and it would be too easy. Hmm. It's not our internet, is it? I don't know. Yeah. Could serenade our audience with some karaoke. You guys are working on that. <laughs> Julie wants to see Enzo. No, Enzo. Oh. He's very sleepy. I'm going to just have to take this offline just for another second. Okay. We'll be right back again. Sort of. Want to say something in the chat? I'm going to. All right, hey guys, are we back? Can you see see and hear? I can't see me on the monitor. You can't? No. I mean, that's probably for the best. I don't want to look at myself. <laughs> Anyone hear us? Yes. I think the video is back. Okay, why don't I see it? You see now, oh, now I can see it. <laughs> oh, everybody gets a cookie after this for who, who survives, weathers this storm with us. Send out one cookie to each viewer. How's it looking over there, Mr. Farkas? I think we're looking a little better. Okay. Let me see the chat here real quick. Video back, much better. Yeah. Yeah, people seem to be... Okay. Content. Let me ask Julia okay. one. Oh, I lost it on the monitors. Now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> David's crawling around the studio. You're missing this. This is great action. Okay. Holy Woo! moly. We are apparently back after a long delay. Sorry. Um, I hope everyone had a nice break. That's right. This was uh, so refreshment. Inter intermission, intermission, intermission. Intermission. Intermission for everybody who needed a uh, snack break, a bathroom break, whatever. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Welcome to the wonderful world of uh, digital technology. Seriously, no matter, mm -hmm. you know, we've overall our tech test has been pretty good. We've had a couple of snafus, but hey, it happens. All right. That's okay. We were Talk talking about, about bags. Bags. Hard but, to believe that was 10 minutes ago, but. I think you got to go through that whole thing again. I am okay. going to, and, but by the way, if anything weird happens in the feed, please say so in the chat because David is monitoring as well as Jose. So the question was, Way back in 842 time, the bag choice for street and travel. And I was saying, I don't know how much that got caught, but essentially there are literally thousands of bag options. Like a Star Miami carries several hundred. So we've brought some with us tonight. We are eventually next year going to do a bag, bag episode. So yeah. an episode all about camera bags. Tonight we're gonna show a couple that we like personally for travel and street work um yeah so okay yeah. so what we're talking about first yes. is i personally have way too many camera bags yeah <laughs> way too i many. just i just hi i'm david i have a camera bag problem um and a tripod problem and a camera problem i have a lot of problems yeah don't we all mm. okay <laughs> so what we're saying is 
I, I think we need to qualify that there's certain characteristics that you're going to look for in a camera bag for travel photography and street photography that may not be suited to landscape photography or you know shooting a wedding. These are very different kind of use cases. So there's not one perfect bag, but there's definitely bags that that we tend to gravitate towards. Or I was just say because because bags are such a personal taste issue. Yes. You know what looks really good to me, my wife despises. Yeah. Um, you know what Josh likes, nobody likes. But since we lost ten minutes, let's dive in. Why don't we each take a turn and we'll like pick three bags to show that we like. Yeah, we can um, we can go into some bags. Have a little fun. So what? Why don't you go first? Why don't you grab a bag? Do you want to show the folks at home who are uh, watching that okay. you like to do travel or street with? All right, I'm just gonna. Well, the question was someone mentioned about Ona, so I did actually want to show this off, which is a a new bag from Ona called the Rockaway, I believe. I don't know. You grabbed it. <laughs> Does it have a tag on it? Yeah. We, yeah, the ro- the we don't even know our own bags. We have so many. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. Um, first, and, and Josh, will, sorry, Josh will probably show this. He yeah. has one of himself. This is the Bowery, the Ona Bowery, and Josh can show his uh, during his segment. But this is probably one of the most popular street and travel bags. So I'll let Josh talk about that one. I did want to go over this, which I think is pretty cool because it's kind of the same size and layout, but a a different philosophy. So I'm just gonna throw this on here. And what's cool is it's a mm, turn around. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Very stylish. Yep, very stylish. So this is a a single strap. This is just like tissue paper that's on here. Right? I know. Yeah. We so, grabbed a new one for so yeah, sling nice. bag. And what's cool is it opens away from you. So, if I take the zipper, okay, it opens away, which is pretty cool. And this is, like many Ona bags, very well suited to to M lenses. And maybe Jose can get a close up for me. It's out of focus. It is a little out of focus. A little bit closer. We got to move closer. We got to take the bag off your shoulder first. Right. Let me just take it yeah, off. Yeah, but yeah. but the point is, let me grab a few things just to kind of show. So what's cool here is if I'm walking around, I can carry it more comfortably because it's crossbody, swing it around, open it up, do a lens change, grab a camera, put something away, remember to zip it up always. Safety tip, guys. This is the Ona Rockaway. And then, yeah, and then you slide it out of the way and you're back to shooting. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, It's a new bag. I haven't, it's very new, obviously the paper's still on it. I haven't gotten a chance to use this one out in the field, but I'm kind of excited about it. It's got a leather outside, and then on the back is uh, canvas so it doesn't rub up against your clothes. Nice little pocket and a uh, lightweight bag. Yeah. So That's nice. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, so why don't you take a turn well, here? Well, like David was saying, my favorite bag of all time by a huge margin is the Ona Bowery. I have two of them. I have one normal one, and this is a special edition that was never even sold in the U.S., but, you know... I got I to gotta flex it a little bit, uh, but it's basically the same. Um, the Bowery is the perfect size for an M kit. I can actually fit an SL2 with a 24 to 90 or another SL lens in this bag as well. What's cool is when you take the strap off, which I will do now, this can also work as a an insert for a larger bag. So if you want to carry, let's say, in a rolling bag or in a backpack, like an extra kit, Strap comes off, and it's actually a very compact bag insert. It's canvas. They make them in leather as well. I like the canvas uh, better. It compresses really thin, and I always have like a bunch of random. I have yellow, red, black, all kinds of random inserts. I have like four different colors of inserts <laughs> that I've cannibalized for different bags because I'm always configuring it in different ways. What I do is I keep my extra inserts at the bottom, just flat, and they act as extra padding when I'm not using them, and then I can configure the bag in different ways when I am. But you can literally put, I'll show you, an SL2 with a 24 to 90 in this bag while having a little bit of room left over. I'll show you here. Can we get a close up of this? Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. So this bag will actually fit an SL2 with a 24 to 90, and there's still about, I can't quite show you, but there's about two inches of room left you could put, um, you know, a filter in there or maybe a charger or something. Um, so you've got. A bag that'll fit an SL2 or a bag that'll fit an M body with at least two or three lenses mm-hmm. or more. So they're not expensive. They wear really well. I've had this one for a number of years and it's treating well. So Ona Bowery, 
uh, BWR. Our colleague Peter. Yes. That's his go-to bag as well. Yeah, the one David showed is the same model, but in uh, this is field tan. David had one in smoke. Can you show that again real quick? The yeah. smoke battery. And then I will defer to you for your next selection. The smoke. It's pretty nice. It's got like uh, kind of cognac leather accents. Uh, pretty classy. And a lot of people mistake here. Get a close up. A lot of people mistakenly try to unbuckle this. It's uh, no. You actually just hit the little snap here and open it like that. So yeah. really nice. So same bag that I just showed, except that is in the smoke color. What do you want to? What do you want to show next? Well, David? someone mentioned uh, Billingham Hadley, so okay. I may as well show that. Now, this is kind of like a really classic mm. street photo bag mm. that's been around since a long time. <laughs> uh, this is very very British. Uh, I happen to have one in a like a kind of a British green with tan accents. It's it's very smart, as they would say. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is this is the Billingham. Uh, it the snaps here. You don't undo the buckles. Kind of the same thing. You actually use the little. Meh. This is brand new, so David's going to struggle with it a little <laughs> bit because yeah, the leather gets is quite stiff when it's right. new. Obviously, it softens up. We so you use. yeah, hey, I see. Uh, I've got it on the close up here. Okay, yeah. So what you do is you kind of it does soften up, like Josh said. Yeah, they're very stiff when they're new, but that's and that's okay. You do that, and you open it like that. Okay, it's got some nice deep. Uh, pockets. I know some photographers actually can throw, you might even be able to throw a, lens, a small lens in here. So they're nice and deep, good for lenses, good for whatever. Uh, if you have like a power bank or something, you can throw it in there. So this is a classic for a reason. And it's got a nice oversized flap. And on the inside, we've got a little protector. And then under that, nice soft felt. And you get your spacious interior that you can configure. And again, it's no surprise that it's pretty much the same dimensions in terms of width as an M. So uh, you can fit a lot of stuff in here, especially if you use the front pockets. And it's just such a well-made bag. This is, yeah, it's it's cool. Yeah, I mean, the construction on the Billingham bags is beautiful, unbelievably good. I mean, really, really high quality. And you also, forever. Yeah, you've got a luggage, luggage insert, which actually that's something I really like to do when traveling to make sure that you have a, a luggage attachment piece so you can just throw this on your on your onboard roller. Um, and then having a secure zipper compartment, you know, where you can actually put other things where against your body is really nice. Yeah. So fan of this bag. And Leica used to have, still has one, a mm -hmm. combination bag by mm -hmm. Billingham that mm -hmm. has been around forever. Similar profile to this. A little small. Not as functional yeah. in my opinion. But I think the, the Hadley Pro is is super nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good bag. All right, what do you got? The next bag I want to show is another bag I enjoy very much. This is by Oberwerth, a German manufacturer made in Germany. This is called the Q2 bag. And the reality is this will, or maybe the Q bag, I forget. I think um, it's just a Q bag. What does it say? The, no, they call it the Q2 bag. Oh, yeah. um, this is the black version. A new version in green just was launched, and we should have them next week. It's like a British racing green kind of color, which is cool. It's a vegetable tan leather that is hydrophobic, so the water actually beads off of it. Uh, here we go. We can show it. It's like almost like a suede texture. It's hard to really sh explain on, mm -hmm. on camera. Um, these bags are made in Germany, incredibly well built, very sturdy, and this has this sort of dual snap mechanism on the front. And what, what's nice about this bag is it's actually difficult to find a really, really small but still really high quality bag. So if you just want to bring an M with a one lens and a charger or a Q2 or something really small, this bag, I will show you, it's red inside, like the Leica red. So this bag is perfect for that. So it's an extremely high quality, durable bag that's water resistant, that is discreet and small, and will fit perfectly a Q2 with a charger or an M with one lens and maybe even two lenses if they're smaller. Um, I think this is one of the more underrated bags in Overworth lineup. People will dismiss it maybe because it says Q2 and they don't have a Q2, but really, um, it's got a pretty nice, here we go, I'm trying to get this strap. Um, substantial strap that's not ungainly, um, leather set with section in the middle. So this is the Oberworth Q2 bag that I am showing. Yep, there you go. Right down. So, very cool. Uh, I just saw a comment yes. here. Uh, Laura asked, will an SL2 fit in the Billingham? Well, well, let's find out. Did you put one in there? I did. Okay. Here's an SL2. Well, not an SL601, but. Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's exactly the same profile. Here, here's an SL with a 35. Dis discussion. Yep, and if you put it in sideways, you can see that it does fit. You're doing a bad job with this bag here. Thank you. There we go. No, I am. You're doing yeah. a good job. 
<laughs> so it does fit, and actually it leaves room for a whole other lens in here. You uh, know, this is what's really cool, just to interrupt for a second, about the M profile bags, meaning these bags that are designed to fit. That width, yeah. Is that if it fits an M with a lens sideways, it's almost certainly going to fit yep. an SL2 with a lens, which is pretty nice. Yeah. But you already showed that one. Let's show them a different one. So, um, so along the same lines, this is another Oberworth bag, mm. which is almost identical to the one you showed, but it's not called a Q2 bag. Yep. This one, I think, is the... What is this one called? The... Yeah, that one. There's, we don't. We should know all this stuff, but our brains are full of the cameras and lenses, so we have nothing left. This is the Boulevard, Okay. and it comes in different finishes. Uh, this one's a more traditional uh, black leather, and you guys cannot even imagine... Like, it's so... Yeah, you have to touch it. Yeah, the, the Boulevards are... So soft. This is a much... This is a lighter weight construction than the Q2 bag. It's a physically lighter bag. It's... Just like it's hard but to But it's explain. still red on the inside. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it still fits camera really nicely. Yeah. And actually, if you you can put a camera and a lens on one side, and we'll talk about this. But if you have a back-to-back -back cap lens orientation, what are we talking about it now? Well, because so, we're not done with the bags. So I know, but this fits, it segues into the bags really well. There. Okay. We should talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, All while right. we're talking about bags, uh, you got to be kidding me. What did, what happened? Did we lose? How did we did we lose power? Oh my goodness! Wow. Okay. There are forces w working against us Ooh. outside of our control, preventing us from talking to you tonight. Wow. This is uh, a lot yeah. of meteors in the air. Was that in the forecast? I didn't see meteors no. in the forecast. Wow. This is awful. Okay. <laughs> are we good? Wait. Before we keep going. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Oh my goodness. Well, that was that was uh, interesting. What what happened? I don't even know. Um. <laughs> we're getting can't see you. Can you see us now? <laughs> Somebody please tell us. Oh man. We know we did so many perfectly fine episodes and only recently have we started. I think, you know, there's some electromagnetic sun solar flares, solar flares. happening. Solar flares that are, and um, meteors. We're sorry again. Um are people are people still here? What's the chat say? I don't know. Let's see. You're back. Yeah, we're good. Where did you go? <laughs> uh what did I do? I don't know. I must have dropped something. <laughs> Oh, we're sorry, but let's, we're going to keep going. Okay, so what we're talking about, is, I'm going to let David talk about it, is a solution for the fact that the majority of camera bags like this Tall. have height because they are designed for camera bodies and traditional size lenses. M lenses being so small, even the biggest ones, how do you take advantage of that extra height? Right. Go. So, because they're so small, uh, you can use what's called a back-to-back -back cap, and I'll wait for a close-up here. Okay, so again, if you have a small M lens and you have a bag this size, you can see how much space that would take up. It's a lot of wasted space, but you don't want to pile things on top of the lens because obviously there's a lot of glass here. So what we use is this back-to-back -back system. Who okay. makes it, David? Uh, this is made by Optech, and we do have a link in the description. Okay, so you mount one that way, and they do lock in. So these back caps do have a rubber gasket in them. Right here. Which is nice for keeping dust and moisture out of the back of your lens. Yep. They do have to be, you'll see there's a, a ridge. A bump. So you mount your your lens on the bit. This cap, similar to how it is on the camera, you line up the red Leica dot and that's with it. the notch on the cap. Yep. Yeah. So now they're they're mounted. <laughs> they're they're mostly mounted oh, on there. Oh, you almost dropped it. I almost did. You gotta There you go. It. You gotta okay. actually put it in there. there so go. that's mounted on both sides, and you notice the dots don't actually align because they're turned in different directions. And then now you'll see that it takes up almost the exact right amount of space in the bag. And all I do is drop it in. Yeah, what's nice too is this, if you just had one lens in there, it may risk be bouncing up and down in the bag during mm -hmm. carrying around. This also prevents that. So right. the, the back, show what it looks like without any lenses on it. Um, do we have another one floating around? Yeah, yeah. right here. No, there you go. Just so you can see, sort of looks like, so it literally is essentially two rear caps sandwiched together, except yeah. done officially. Really, really well made. And again, made by Optech. Super cool. So just a nice little hack to 
maximize the space in these sort of M-sized camera bags. Absolutely. Yeah. So Sweet. big big fan of the back to back caps. Yeah. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, if I'm carrying five lenses, it actually doesn't take up that much space because here's four lenses. Yeah. Okay. And then one on the camera. And these will easily fit in a bag. Yeah. So a Bowery I, will fit that. So will the Padley you just had. Exactly. You know, this is a little smaller. Really, I would say maximum of camera with one lens and two extra lenses in the side uh, on, you know, in the back to back orientation. Yeah. So this is going to be really, I mean, it's a feather. This yeah. thing weighs almost nothing. So uh, it's nice and classy, doesn't attract a lot of attention. So this is a, a super nice bag. Yeah. Me. That was the Ona, or excuse me, the Oberworth Boulevard. Yeah. And just as a follow up, this is the Freiburg, I think, or the. Sorry, no, this is the Harry and Sally. It's my turn now, David. Not to show your bag. <laughs> to show my bag. Well, you don't get two turns in a row. This, this is a follow-up oh, to that. It's a follow-up. It's a continuation. I will permit it. Go okay. Ahead. So the Harry and Sally, again, it's a really soft leather. It's got these. So uh, say the model, Flower. This is the Oberworth Harry and Sally. Thank you. Like the movie yes. with Billy Crystal and Meg yeah. Ryan. Okay. So uh, get a close-up on that. This and, is the espresso color. I believe they also have black and who knows They blue. do. Yeah. And these snaps, again, are really cool because they're magnetic. So you pull on it and it releases, and then you just line it up and snap and it self-closes. So these are really cool. Very secure, but also really easy to get in and out of. Uh, the flaps are really lightweight. And with this one, because it's the same profile in terms of that, that M height, but what's really great about this is I can put a camera with one lens, and then on either side, I can put my back-to-back -back cap orientated lens, one here and one on the other side. So this is about as compact as you're gonna get. That's an M kit with five lenses in something that is really, really compact and still passes my 10 pound rule. Okay, so that is basically the maximum that I would carry right there. That's pretty nice. I mean, look about how small that bag really is, sort of holding in front of you, David. Yeah, and look that's at that. That's five yeah. lenses in an M body in that. Yep. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's All impressive. right, your turn. And that's my turn. So the last bag I'm going to show is another Ona bag, another bag that I personally own. This is probably one of the most misunderstood bags in the Ona lineup. This is the Union Street. Um, this is also in smoke, which is that gray color. These all come in like different colors and leather and stuff. The reason I like this bag is because it's really long. What that allows me to do is two different things. Number one, it's good for a laptop when I'm bringing a laptop with camera gear. Number two, it's one of the few bags that I can fit the SL2 with the 90-280 on it in it because it's long enough. Um, I'll just open it up here. It's got two buckles. You know, it's nice because if even if you don't have it full of stuff or if you just have some M lenses in here, it does sort of the back is also canvas, and it kind of molds to your body a little bit as you're carrying it around, so it doesn't feel as big as it is. I, I just traveled to the West Coast with this over the summer. I had an SL2 with two TL lenses, filters, a laptop, um, a bunch of other stuff, like a travel stuff. This is my carry-on, and I put it under the seat on the plane. It fit perfectly, and I think they make the Brixton, which is a size down from this, but I like the Union Street because it has that width, mm -hmm. so it's... It's not much more space that's actually in my way. If it had more height, yes. If it had more depth, yes. But because it's just extra width, it's like free space. I can use it for the 9280. I can use it for a bigger M kit. I can actually fit, um, we'll talk about tripods later. I can fit a tabletop tripod on top and put the flap over. You want to, if you show me one, I can, I can actually take, do it like this, <laughs> there you go, a tabletop tripod and put it on top. And I just lengthen the little flaps here and I can yep. close the bag with my gear inside and the tabletop tripod on top nice. because I have that length. So the Union Street, to me, is one of the most versatile larger bags without being ungainly. I mean, to me, it looks like a traditional, yeah. you know, business messenger bag. Yeah. yeah. You know, like yeah. a laptop bag. And I've traveled with it without any camera gear, like other than maybe, you know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll have a Q2 in there and then the rest of it is work stuff or travel stuff and then I'll have a backpack or something for an S kit. So. Anyway, that is my last selection here, which is the Ona Union Street, which again, in this case, is the smoke finish. Okay, you get one more bag, and then we're gonna go to the next Can topic. I get another bag? Okay. This is the last one, I promise. 
Yeah, I will mention, by the way, that I'm also a big fan. I didn't I didn't bring any, but I'm a big fan of the Think Tank retrospective line um, because they're also very lightweight and very accommodating for different size systems. But I'm going to show this one because oh. we are talking about small and light, and I only get one back. <laughs> so this is also kind of a classic bag in the in Leica world. This is an artisan and artist, which is a Japanese company. Uh, and we didn't really mention, but Oberworth are all uh, designed and built in Germany. I mentioned it. Did you mention yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this one is a Japanese bag. And the I think the owner of the company is into Leica. So these were one of the original bags kind of formatted and shaped for Leica cameras. And which model is this? This is the ACAM 1100, which is about as minimal as it gets. You've just got a front pocket. Yeah, 1100. Yeah. But Thank as minimal you, as it gets. You got <laughs> just a, a main compartment and you have a front pocket area and that's it. And it's and this is a really, small bag. This is smaller, I think, even than the Bowery. It is. It is. Oh yeah. Definitely smaller than the Bowery. So this is one of the smallest, lightest bags you can get. And it still has a little luggage strap. Here, get a close up of that. Yeah, that's pretty nice. You got a little luggage strap slash, if you flip it over, a little hand strap, but it does have a shoulder strap inside. Uh, you also get a rear pocket, which is nice, and a kind of a little snappy thing that you can reach in there. Okay, so looking inside, again, I'll got, and it's a, I, something I've liked is the artisan straps are really comfortable. They have this kind of quilted bit over here and it's non-skid uh, rubber, rubberized on this side. So for such a small bag to have such a substantial strap, they're very, very comfortable and they break in and get really soft. But it's, the key here is it, it's a removable strap. So it you is. can put on whatever strap you want. So you're not stuck with that one. Right. So same deal. Okay. I can, well, I didn't adjust this, but it's a little tight squeeze. Uh, so it'll fit an M camera. And again, remember the height using our back to back cap. Perfect to clear the bag. And that will actually, it looks like it's not going to close, but that's no, it'll close. It's a perfect fit. It's just, a little, yeah, there you go. That looks better. Right. This is, this is a really nice bag. Um, I've used a, a larger version uh, with, with an over flap for a long time. Uh, okay, can come back to me. Uh, the ACAM 7200, which is basically like this bag, but instead of just a zipper top, it has a an open top with a flap, but it's kind of the same size and, and the weight, which is, I mean, really, it's like next to nothing. Yeah. So I like when the bag is lightweight, but still accommodates and still offers some level of protection. And uh, yeah, the artisan bags are extremely functional. Yes. Extremely, extremely functional. Not as they're not flashy. Elaborate or flashy no. or you know, whatever as the Billingham or the Oberworth, but extremely functional. Which Very is much so. sometimes really inconvenient. I mean, you know, we have half a bags. dozen artisan bags in our yeah. like oh, yeah. neither we didn't bring for the most part our own bags other than the two Onas because they're sort of new. Because they're ruined, but <laughs> I can assure you <laughs> that you don't want to see those and they're covered in dog fur. It's a disaster. Yeah. Um whew. Okay, we spent I a lot of time talking about we bags. That. We've probably missed a million questions in the chat. Why don't we quickly skim the chat so that we... Oh, uh, the, it was a Hadley... I think it's either a Hadley small or a Hadley medium on the bag to answer your question. Someone, was, was a the, couple of people were asking about what, that. What does the tag say? Um, I'm just going to look it up. Okay. The sage it's it's a small. Yeah, Hadley small. Hadley that small. was sage, the sage finish. Okay, back to the questions, please. Back to the questions. Uh, let's see. With Haley Oh yeah, they're not they're not beat to hell. They're weathered. I like that. Yeah. Scroll up. Okay. <laughs> Someone said Prince Street is really nice. Prince Street is similar to the Brixton in Ona. Yeah, a little taller. Keep going. No, no, keep going. Okay. Nope, keep going. Uh, is this? Uh, no, we can answer that. We've oh that yeah, notebook. This is actually I should talk about that too, but. You know, I, actually, I'm going to use this as a as a convenient segue. Mm, I love convenient segue. Um, beyond cameras and lenses and, and building out kits, actually, I think is not as complicated. But part of what makes travel photography easier is some of the little things. Mm. It's some of the, the, the things that you only really know that you need because one time you didn't have them, you know, and it's like, now I do. So... I'm just going to show a couple of those. One, I think, and I'm going to use yours, the uh, Pixel Pocket. Oh, there you go. Just so it's full. It's full. <laughs> um, a lot of cards. There's a lot of pictures in here. So memory card organization, uh, especially if you're traveling for an extended period of time, 
as, as I've said in previous episodes, I don't like to delete my cards, which means I need to carry a bunch of cards. So this is the Think Tank uh, SD Pixel Pocket. Okay, and it's very small. It's like a 1980s Velcro wallet. And you can see it's specifically sized for SD cards. It's upside down. There you go. <laughs> it's specifically sized for SD cards. Um, there is other card wallets, but they're usually designed for bigger cards. So what we like about this one is uh, <laughs> yeah. you can hold you can hold nine SD cards. I've actually got this is mine that I use for. You're, testing, are they doubled up? And I've doubled up, and you'll yeah. see I have this crazy variety. It's because some older models need certain size cards and some newer. So this is what I now that I not my like personal travel setup. Just, just this testing is my yeah. like various camera testing setup. So. Nice, and yeah. uh, you can put as Josh has done a business card right there. For identification and another memory and card. Another memory <laughs> card. <laughs> I just said, I don't know what I'm thinking. It's, but look, I mean, that's yeah. Those, you could fit like you could realistically fit like 15 cards in this thing, right? And it's you can slide it in your back pocket, no problem. Yeah. So this this will go in your pocket. Um, yeah, this will go in your pocket, or it's got a little strap. And when they come new, yeah. Josh doesn't have his. Uh, this is a new one. It's got a little tether on it with another clip. I do use this, and I'll talk about it in the landscape episode. I actually clip this on my bag stuff it in, and then when I need to access it, I get it out and it's got a, like a little safety leash and then shove it back in my bag. So this is more for, for landscape, but you can use it, certainly. Snap it on um, one of the sides, you get a close up there, uh, one of the sides of your, your bag, okay? So it's a nice little clippy, but that is removable. So that, that's one thing, um, which I think is really important. Something else that, that is kind of convenient is I like to carry a lot of extra batteries. So there's a couple ways to do that. One. Yeah, I've yeah. got I've got a single battery holder. Let's just go to the close up. A double, yeah. Yeah, it's a single right. battery holder. There we go. And this is actually one by Arte Mano. Nope, Oberworth. This is one by Oberworth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's like we're not stopping right there. Arte Mano makes one as well. This is an Oberworth one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you can just eh, put a battery in here. Happens to be a CL battery and snap it closed, and then this will actually go onto your camera strap. So when we're talking about going out, let's say, with, with a Q or a CL, and you don't want to have any bag with you, uh, you can use this to carry your battery right on your on your strap and yeah, you know, cool. have, it, have it close at hand. So that's kind of neat if you're, let's say, using more batteries, like with an M. I do like these kind of soft-sided holders here. So very similar to the SD card holder, you can just pop your batteries in here, pop in another one, and either throw this into your bag, into a pocket. Uh, this particular one actually uh, is a Temba one. I have a link to this. It has a little belt loop type of thing. So you can put it around a strap, a belt, a, you know, your belt, or yeah, You could whatever. put this on a bag strap on a bag to make strap, it easier exactly. to access your extra batteries without having to dive into the whole bag. Right, and yeah. then, if you're going all out, going full speed, going full speed, this is this is a Think Tank uh, battery DSLR battery holder for very lightweight. There's not much to it, and when you're not using it all, you can just fold it up. But I like this because for I'm gonna yeah, oh, you need, yeah, you need the bigger batteries. Yeah, there we go. Let's say for an SL battery, it'll hold that, or it'll hold an M10 battery really nicely. Let's see, I'll give you one. Yep. Hold, please. We gotta take them out of the cameras. Here we go. Got it. Okay. Here's an M10 battery, and so it holds M10 battery, SL2 battery, and you can hold up to four. And then this is nice and organized, and it's nice and organized. <laughs> and you put it into your uh, bag pocket, which is really nice. Yeah. It just so, keeps everything together. Protects the contacts, the batteries. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I kind of like things like that. These are. Little nothing. Take my things. batteries back. <laughs> You'll leave them in here, otherwise I know you. Thought I was getting away with something. <laughs> um, another another kind of travel essential that I always carry is one of these or two of these sometimes. So this is called. This one's a little beat up, as you can see, because I've used it. This is called a My Charge. I like this size. This is a 6700 milliamp hour, and you can check the status of the battery right there. So it's a full battery. And what I really like about this. Battery pack. There's a lot of battery packs by like Anchor or Mophie or whatever. My the reason I like this one is because it's got built-in uh, mains prongs. You just plug it in when you want to charge it up, and then snap it closed. And you don't have to remember to carry cables with you because 
it has cables built in so I can charge my phone. And what I'll do is I'll just keep this kind of folded over and I can put that in my camera bag to keep things charged up because you don't realize how important it is to keep a fully charged phone when traveling because that's your maps, that's your navigation, that's how you look up you know, where you're gonna go eat. Where or you're... if you're using the Photos app to geotag on the SL2. Or if you're using the Photos app, you can keep it charged up at all times. Yeah. I was gonna say also for translation, I love Google mm -hmm. Translate. You can talk into it and have a conversation with somebody in two different languages, which is awesome. But, you know, having power with you is gonna be great. Another thing is, this is a little bit larger unit. This is a 10,000 something milliamp hour version of that. And if you have the SL2, um, or the TL2, both of those cameras can charge using this connector, there which is a USB-C connector. So I've actually used this uh, to recharge my camera batteries while I'm stopped, you know, for grabbing a bite or something. And this has a lot more capacity, so you can charge your phone, iPad. And there's, just and to confirm, there's are, there are links to these. I have links to these, yeah. In the description for the video, so you don't have to write these down. They nope. are there. My charge. Um, so when I, we're talking like about that. charging. I want to talk about, these, um, no, I want to talk about these little guys. We've probably addressed these before, but now I can kind of summarize. When you buy a new, like a camera, a system camera, you get the battery charger and usually a six foot power cable, which is kind of a pain to carry, especially if you have multiple chargers. So a solution we found years ago, and we sell these and we use these, are shorter options that have the same sort of figure eight style plug and mm -hmm. that plug into your charger. So there's actually four that I have with me that we'd sell. And then there's a European one, which I didn't bring. So I have here a uh, super current Leica M9 charger, but it's the same concept. All the Leica battery chargers use this um, kind of figure eight adapter here. That's the car adapter. So there's four. So you've got what's called the one foot power cord. This is literally just a one foot long straight power cord. Plugs in, allows you to charge with a shorter cord. Very straightforward. Then you've got the one foot low profile cord. This is nice if you are tight on space or if you're using like one of those hotel lamps that has plugs in it and you want it to sit flat. This is the one foot low profile cord. Uh, the two that are, or the one that's the most popular is this. This is the angled plug adapter. And this basically makes any, like a battery charger, into a compact wall charger. Honestly, if you have it like a camera, you should just have, sorry, I'll go center here. You should, this is why I wore a light shirt, see, look at that. <laughs> you should have one of these. I also use, the last one is the straight plug adapter. And this is nice if you've got a power strip with multiple chargers, because you can stack them sort of vertically and they don't interfere with each other and you can maximize your power strip space. Um, so anyway, those are just four sort of alternative solutions for the built-in or the um, included cables you get with the Leica battery chargers. And they work with M10, Q2, any Leica camera that you can buy today or even a few older generations that has the little removable power cord from the battery charger, these work with. So kind of must-haves even if you're just at home, I don't know. I don't even use the, the long cords. I just keep them in the box. I don't even use them. Um, David's got some other power related doodads here. Um, these are international adapters. Yep. So many countries here. Oh, well, I um, travel. And this is, I don't know what country this is for. That's Western Europe. There you go. And Iceland. And these are linked in the... Yes. Because like a, a charger voltages are global. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you don't need to have big bulky converters. You can just use one of these power adapters and you're good to go. I'm not gonna show them all because I think the concept is pretty clear, but don't feel like you need to get some huge thing. What else do you have in here? Oh, this is cool. This is a USB one. This is nice. Well, so yeah, this one. <laughs> okay, why don't you yeah, show okay. it? your stuff. All right, so, your toys. so I like to always, you know, make sure that you have kind of a go bag full of world chargers so that you're ready to go anywhere you need to go. That way you can keep all of your you know, your main chargers and all that, uh, just with AC plugs, and then you can use these. And and one of the reasons I like this particular one, you can get a close up for that. Oh, he's not over on your side. Oh, yet. okay. <laughs> give, give him a second. That's okay. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I like is it doesn't just have rear prongs, but it also has a second set of prongs on the top. There we I go. I think we're about to get a close up here. Mm, maybe. maybe. There we go. We're trying. He's thinking about it. He's strongly considering it. There we go. Okay, so um, not just do you have plugs here, 
but you also have a second set of plugs here. So you can actually plug two things into this one adapter, which I like these. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I think I also put a link to adapters that are like this, but also have USB. So it's like a little bit bigger and has two USB chargers. My method is also, because I go to kind of Western European type countries, uh, I make sure to have a phone charger with native European plug. Yeah. And I, I think I picked this up in Frankfurt Airport at you know a cell phone place. Yeah. Because uh, I just want to make sure that I don't have to use my power for my cameras for my phone, which is usually you know next to my bed. Yeah. So anyway, it's nice to have, you know, whether I think I've got like Argentina and yeah Europe. Or, or, I think they get it. Anyway, <laughs> let's you, keep you going. Take a little bag. Make sure you have it with you. Let, let's take a break for a minute from Gizmos and just I want to make sure we haven't missed. I'm sure there's more questions because it's 9:30 and I want to get to the what people's questions. They want to know things, and we are here to. Give them those things. What do we got? Let's go to the bottom. There we go. Uh, Nightcore. So we are, I'll touch on this once. We used to carry Nightcore chargers. We did not find them as reliable as we would have liked. They didn't cause any damage. They just sometimes wouldn't work. So we stopped carrying them. I don't know if they've updated them or not. That's just how we do it. So sorry. And to answer a question that's in here about the safety of using third party batteries in an M10, Ooh, no. I would not. If you're spending like a money, just buy the darn battery. I mean, the reality is, and I've said this a thousand times on this show, I refuse to shoot around battery life because if I'm going to travel somewhere, even if it's somewhere nearby, I don't want to compromise the way that I'm making images based on the fact that I only had one battery or only have two batteries if mm -hmm. it's a long, long day because it's a lot cheaper to buy another battery than it is to go back to Paris to get that shot that you missed, which may never happen again. Um, it's important to remember that the quantity of batteries that Leica, well, they don't make them themselves, but that Leica offers mm -hmm. in terms of the number of batteries they sell in a year is a fraction of a percent of what these massive companies make. So yes, they are more expensive because I can only imagine when Leica goes to a battery supplier and says, we want this number, they go, what, a day? And they go, no, no, <laughs> for, the, for, all, for, all, for all time. Um, especially the SL2 and Q2 batteries because they have part of the camera's weather sealing integrated into them, which must have been a very complex design for a small company like Leica to commission. So it is part of the deal, but if you're going to take the time to invest in Leica, invest in your skills, and you know you're gonna be out and about for a day of shooting, get two or three spare batteries. We offered a couple of really cool solutions for storing them. And trust me, you'll be glad you did. Um, I try to replace my primary battery every two years or so with a fresh one. And then I relegate that previous one to backup. And I always write the purchase date on the battery, either with a label or like a paint pen or something. That is a good plan too. So I know how old it is. Otherwise, how do you remember? Um, so just some general battery advice, lecturing, whatever. Yeah, have more batteries. Yeah, have pretty much. Because it is definitely, I, I mean, I know we've said these exact words before, but uh, I would rather, like Josh said, don't don't frame your whole shooting around how many batteries you have. Because I would rather carry four extra batteries and be able to shoot from morning to night without having to go back and charge all my batteries again, and I'm missing all those kind of shots. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's just part sure of the deal. I, and this is true with, in my opinion, with any camera from any brand, not just like a. Sure. Is I never would ever 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 go even in my non like a days back in college, I just simply wouldn't go out with one battery because I'm not prepared to again compromise my photography based mm -hmm. on the fact that I didn't have an extra battery. That's right. not worth it to me. Um, yeah, I Next. agree. Most difficult live stream to get through in the history of live streams. Hmm. I don't know what okay. is happening right now. I have many, many theories. Solar winds I posted, maybe covering all the, the cables and dog treats was the problem. I don't really know. Are we back? What are the What are the people saying, David? No audio, no sound, no sound. Jose, are we muted still? Do we have audio? 
Hello, hello. Can you guys hear us? How the meters look? Yeah, good. Can you hear us? Yep. And now there's sound. All right, we're back. <laughs> we don't know what happened. Wow. This is insane. This is wild. If you've watched the past 20 episodes, we've had an occasional bug, but never anything like this. Jeez. What is happening tonight? Somebody out there does not want us talking about street photography. I don't know who it is. I think if you're there, watching, there, there's a conspiracy for well, sure. I will find you and I will take your picture. Okay. Um, so, um, just oh on goodness. a lighter note, yeah. I do want to share this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why yeah, let's, not? Let's, let's ease back <laughs> in and then we promise we're going to keep going. Um, um, I do want to share this with you because yes. there is cool stuff. Yes. Um, this is a mm. new design from uh, Red Dot Wear, which is our clothing brand. Swag is always cool. So you can get a cool... Uh, M3 top plate shirt in the new pewter color, and it is silky, silky soft. Mm -hmm. Very, very lightweight tri-blend. Good job, Kirsten, on the design, nice. as usual. Uh, so check that out. Uh, Red Dot Wear, we've got some new new stuff coming. Yeah, we do have new stuff coming, don't we? We do. Sweet. There's even more stuff. Shameless plug, but, you know, it's the least we can do. It's cool. It's a shirt. I have one of everyone. I, I wear them all the time, and they're awesome. I know. That's but like... If we're out, I mean, and people know Leica, they always say, like, guys, I like it. It's kind of funny, actually. Yeah. It's like a secret handshake almost. Yeah, um, why not? If you don't have your camera with you, which is rare, I guess. Whew. What were we talking about again? Hamsters, mm. I think? Um, I don't remember. Hamster wheels? Yeah, I think that's what Hamster it feels wheels. like it sometimes. Uh, we were talking about all the little knickknacks and things that go into... Oh, well, we were talking about batteries. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want, um, yep. I want to talk about this. Okay, more cool. cool stuff. And then yeah, we should cool really... Stuff. And then I think Jose had posed a question about something did we answer it i think we answered it oh my goodness people will tell us the people the people will tell us the, the people. people will tell us okay Please tell us okay what do you got what do you got there uh so this is a cool thing we're gonna get a close-up here um so this is part of staying organized and it's a cool little wallet doohickey and inside it can hold you actually have to get these separately if you guys are familiar with the field notes you just slide the slide a little empty one in here and i've got my very cool no you can't have it like a pen that i had to go all the way to germany to buy in the leica store there and then i can hand out business cards and i can there's also a little pocket so i can store other stuff but this is great for this is great for you know just putting in a pocket of your camera bag and especially when i when i shoot portraits of people um I'm not a sneak up on them kind of person. I'm a, I want to talk to them and know their story and get to know them a little bit and then say, hey, you mind if I take a portrait? And often that comes down to, oh, can you send me a copy? It's like, sure. So having a way easily that you can hand that over with a pen and have them write their information down is really nice. You can hand them a card, say, email me. Yeah. But generally, if they give you their info, it'll be good. Another idea that I had kind of diffuse the situation um, if someone gives you a little bit of a why are you taking pictures or what are you taking pictures for is actually to bring up Instagram on my phone and say, I'm a travel photographer and here's my Instagram. And very often it's, oh, here's mine. And hey, I'll follow you. Um, if you find me cool, cool, like can you DM it to me? So uh, an idea I had is actually make up business cards with Instagram information that you can hand out as a photographer because... I don't think that was your idea, but... Totally my idea. <laughs> no one's been, ever thought of I it I think before. it's been done, but yes, it is. Let's... um. But anyway, let's... Uh, let's this is a rapid fire question. Yeah. I feel like we're way behind. Yeah, I'm going to let, I'm gonna let Jose pose some questions for oh. us. And we're going to try to keep our answers... And yes, I also have a moleskin. Okay, one okay. Enough, Someone enough asked a question. Gizmos. Okay, let's, let's, let's try to do some rapid fire stuff because I really want to make sure... We give the people the time they deserve since we had about 20 minutes of downtime. Sorry about that. Jose, go. All right. What's the best all-rounder tripod for travel photography? Ooh, good question. This is David's bread and butter. Including or, compactness, weight, functionality, quality. Bread and vegan butter. Uh, <laughs> show the people what you got, David. What do I have? What am I going to show? Jose's got the chat. Don't get distracted. Okay, I'm distracted. Don't I get distracted. What do you got for a tripod? Okay. Jose, ask the question again. What do you suggest for an all-rounder tripod for travel photography, okay. including compactness, weight, functionality, and quality? Okay, well, we've got three options here. Four options, if you count. We those. have four thousand options here. Why don't we okay, so quickly show these three? Yeah, we're going to talk mo a lot more about tripods in our landscape episode because obviously, like Josh said at the top of the show, ninety percent of your stuff is when you're traveling is probably going to be no tripod. 
Um, yet 90% of your shots when you're doing landscape are going to be on a tripod. So they're very different criteria. Here, we want to make sure we have the weight down. Um, we're using smaller cameras, smaller systems, so we don't need as much. At a bare minimum, I really recommend just a tabletop tripod. And I think you can get a close up there. This is a Sure tabletop tripod. It's it's pretty compact. You can fit it right in your bag. Legs fold out. It's I know little... we're I know we're out of these, but I promise you, Kirsten ordered more. We're gonna no, get more we're, we're gonna get them next week. Yeah. So don't don't yell at us. And you know, it's got a decent a decent ball head with a uh, you know a nice little quick release plate there. And yeah, this is a good option. It's not crazy expensive. It's pretty high quality for the price. It is. It's, it's I all use aluminum, it. no plastic. Um, I use it on my desk all the time for like product shots and stuff. And it fits in a bag. It fits actually in any up and down, bags. like 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 a lens. Yeah, like just slides right in. Yeah, it's pretty nice. But let's keep let's keep going because we're. Uh, I do like the Leica one. Um, where are the light? Oh, the legs. The legs are, are in there. Hold on, hold on. Keep the close up. All right, so I'm going to show. This is this is probably one of the. This interrupt you for a second while I get this out. This is probably one of the least recognized Leica products. That's actually quite good for what it is. It's amazing. Yeah. Um. Here you go, David. Okay. And now so take it, it away. So it's two parts. You get the the base and the head. And actually there's four different heads available for it. This is a silver large head, then it comes in black, and then there's a compact one that's in silver and black as well. So it's modular. What's cool about this and the way the legs are is first of all, when you put it in your bag, you put it in like this, okay? And everything kind of takes up a very small vertical slot. Or you can lay it flat, like say in a front pocket of a of a bag, of a shoulder bag. The legs are solid, so they're not, there's no hinge here. They actually rotate kind of like if you're familiar, like a C stand in a studio. And then they lock together. There's a little twist lock uh, that tensions the legs all together. And now they you have a nice wide base with rubber feet. And this is a, actually a quarter twenty thread it is. here. So you could, and it has a little bit of um like material here. You could actually put your camera right on this if you want. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to have the head. Right. And now you put the head on. Here we go. Doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I like the old spin method here. Nice. Yeah. And like it's actually been making these for decades. Oh my gosh. There's vintage ones that are really cool. They're this all hammer sound, whatever. The, the this is a modern one. one and it is really solid. So I'm going to explain why this is different and definitely I think somewhat better suited than this. This is a great little tripod for sure. But uh, Jose, you back out the shot here. I'm going to show the people. Oh, what do you want? Uh, an M camera. I have many of them. <laughs> Take okay. your pick. Now I want to yeah. I want to demonstrate here. So uh, yes, you can actually. This has um, threading here, so you you don't have to do what I'm doing. I'm just doing it out of habit. Just going to clear some space for you here. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Go. I got this right here. Okay, so I'm just going to torque right. that on. There you go. Okay, so yes, I've got a tabletop tripod, which is nice, and it's not super low, so I've got a little bit of height here. So if you're shooting on a street, you'll act, or a planter, or whatever, a park bench, you'll actually get some decent height out of it, which is nice. Okay, now that's not all. On the the small tabletop tripod, you don't have the ability to shoot vertically. On here, you do, and you can angle up or down, uh, which is pretty neat. So having that vertical orientation possibility uh, on here is really nice. Now, if you just back out one more time, I'm going to show another neat little trick here. And I need, do you need a visual aid. Which Can is? You grab one of those planks. Really? Yeah, for uh, real. Am I not carrying enough things? I'm literally about to grab a plank. Um, where do I put <laughs> these tripods? Just don't put them somewhere. Just give them to me. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is gear. We want one of the big ones or the small ones? A big one. Big one. Here okay. we go. Are you ready for this, people? This is literally a piece of wood. <laughs> this is why they kept trying to stop us from doing the live stream. Why, why am I holding this? Okay, so what if you don't have a, enough height? Hold it vertically here. I see. I see yes. what you want. Okay. Yes, I understand. So what we're doing this is... This is a wall. Pretend this, this is, is a wall. Okay. When is a wall not a wall? When it's a piece of... When, when it's not a, even wood. This is like... Uh, <laughs> this is like... Let's kind of... Uh, kind of Okay. Composite material. So, so here's a neat little trick that a lot of people don't realize that this was actually designed for. And not, it, the wood is a little enough. too narrow. It's not big enough. Okay, but you press it against a wall, and you hold it with one hand, and you can shoot horizontally, as well as change your orientation as well. 
you know, so you can still angle the camera and you just maintain sideward pressure and it'll be super stable because it has these nice rubber feet on it. So this is a really unique use for this tripod. And I've actually done that on a fair amount of occasions where this was the only tripod I was carrying for the day. There we go. And it'll get you by um, pretty well. And like Josh said, I mean, Leica's been making this style for a long time yeah. because it really is very flexible. And yeah, uh, we, yeah, you know, we don't really sell a lot of these tripods. I think people don't know they exist. And they're expensive for what they are. I'm not going to lie. It's not for everyone, but they're really, really cool. Yeah. And I couldn't resist making sure we had one on the show just for the sake of having fun and yeah. showing something cool. But now we can actually get to... This is a tripod tripod, okay? A real, a real tripod, I guess. Now, yeah. this actually costs less than oh, the Leica setup. Don't say that. Setup. Okay. Um, this is a very lightweight. This is another Sure tripod. It's carbon fiber and aluminum. Um, I like that it has a little hook so you can dangle it from your bag. But it's the right size. I'm just going to grab a bag here for a second. So if I grab, let's say, the old the old Billingham here, like Josh was saying, you in a lot of these bags, if you let the um, let the straps out, you can kind of cradle it on top. On this one, because it has it has a hook, it's probably going to get this back in the box. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> okay, you can snap it on and carry it on the side of the bag. So that's can I, another. Can you get closer with that connection so they can see how that works? Because that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Like if I was in a second, there we go. Look at that. Okay, so it's got a little snap connection here. And you... I think that's probably people don't realize that these lightweight tripods like this one, you can do that. Like they're actually, you can bring them with you, and they won't get yeah, I think, in your way. I think this one weighs a little over two pounds, so yeah. like one one kilo. Oh, uh, you, could, you could use that um, trick I did with the Union Street as well, or putting them on the top. Absolutely. So, so this gives you some options here. Um, they also, oh, I got it. Uh, the Sioux Rays, sorry for keep reaching out screen, also come with these little, uh, it comes with this little bag, which has the ability to get caught and everything. The know. ability to get caught. So it has kind of a double strap situation. So you can wear it as a backpack if you want, or just a wider uh, crossbody strap. So you can carry this. And that's what I'll do. I have a, a small Gitzo tripod bag that I carry um, a travel tripod in sometimes. So that is another way. If you don't want it dangling around your camera bag, you can throw it in the bag that's included. So that's kind of neat. And this is a traveler style. Gitso actually created this, and then everyone else was like, that's a great idea. We could do it too. Uh, so this is going to have a... <laughs> no, you're knocking around the M10R. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's, so, okay. it's okay. Uh, so this one, actually, the center column does not retract like in the Gitso because just for um, just for size and compactness, but it does expand. So you can go up like that to get a little more height, which is cool. Um, and of course, you have leg sections, so you can extend it and you get some pretty decent height. It's like a real tripod that happens to fit inside your camera bag or just dangle on the side. Yeah. What's the other one you got? And then the other one I have oh, I'll take care. is also a Sure, but this is more of a standard size tripod. It's getting a little bit more up in weight. I think it's like three and a half pounds. And it's just a lot sturdier because the leg sections are thicker. And it has, you know, just taller. So you get a lot more reach on this one. And uh, the column on this one. Ooh, that was my microphone. <laughs> oh, wait, you got your mic. Sorry about the loud noise on that one, guys. <laughs> well, that's right. It's probably like a thunderstorm. Yeah. Oh, Meteors. Uh, so on here, you can you can drop the column to, for more stability. And it has a double extendable column. Ooh. Yeah, double shiny. extendable. That's cool. And there's, again, there are links to this. Yep. And it's, and it's a bigger head with a bigger plate. Uh, they, we have links to both of these. And they're they're both in the, like, 200... 200-ish radio. Yeah, they're not insane for carbon fiber. Try yeah. that'll work well. We use them ourselves all the time, so... Nice. So, you know, even if it's not, you know, the same kind of class of tripod that I use for my landscape photography, the reality is if I'm using a CL with an 18 millimeter or or a Q2, I, these are not big, heavy cameras. Yeah. And and the idea of the tripod is really just I'm out shooting and I want to shoot a sunset. I want to shoot a sunrise. I want someone asked for the model number, which I don't know if it's... Uh, it's in the description. Yeah, just look at the description because it's like numbers and letters. I don't know what I'll talk about. But I promise you it's linked in it. So, yeah, I have, I have links to both of those. Sorry, David. Keep going. 
Um, so those are just a nice thing to have, even if you decide not to take it. But if the conditions are right and you say, you know what, I'm going to bring a tripod because I'm going to shoot a sunset uh, tonight. We should have a cool, a cool and drinking game. Okay, every time we, do we say cool a lot? Well, because we're old. <laughs> you guys will be really drunk by the time this yeah. live stream is over. Oh, my goodness. Um, also, don't don't be afraid to experiment with some long exposures, uh, in especially in cities where you have light, like car lights or things like that, and you can get really cool colored streaks. You say cool again. <laughs> now I'm going to notice it every time. Uh, so, let's, uh, keep go let's keep going. <laughs> let's keep going. We have so many more questions answered. I'm just, just hang on for a second. I'm, Jose, good. I'm good. I'm good. Jose, what do you got for us? Do I need Sumilux or Noctilux lenses for nighttime street photos? Ah, that's a good question. Um, no. The reality is, starting really with, in my mind, the 246 monochrome, the high ISO capabilities have become so good that you can do low light nighttime street shooting, even at f4, f5, 6, with Sumacrons, Sumerits, or Elmerit lenses. Because if you think about Sumilux being one stop from an Elmerit, 1.4 to 2.8, or is that two stops? One stop. 1.4 to 2.8? Yeah. Two stops. Two stops. Wow. <laughs> two stops, sorry. Uh, right, F2 is one stop. Uh, two stops, right? But the improvements in high ISO performance have gone at least two stops between generations. So the reality is with an M10 monochrome, which is four stops, maybe five stops better than an original monochrome, where a Sumilux would have been required on an original monochrome, you could get away with an Elmar without a problem. So no. If your objective isn't to have that crazy bokeh, or if you want to be shooting at f4 or 5.6 anyway, the low light capabilities of really get starting with the 246 monochrome, which is probably the best low light bang for your buck in the Leica sphere at the moment, allow you to not need to have some crazy 0.95 or 1.0 lens to do nighttime shooting. So I think that's a point for the 246 monochrome, especially if you were to review David's um, current article comparing high ISO performance of SL2, M10, the 246 monochrome, which is in there, is remarkable for a camera that's five years old. So it's insane. Yeah, really. I mean, it don't, don't discredit that. It sure. holds up in 2020. Yeah. That's next. We, yeah, we have a question that's pretty related to that, to high ISO performance. What do you think about the 28 millimeter 5.6 Sumeron mm. for travel photography? It's nice. It's extremely small. <laughs> um, it's certainly not going to get you any bokeh whatsoever, and it does vignette. But from a compact perspective, it's fantastic. It's extremely discreet, even though it's silver, which is a little blingy. But um, let's see if I can get it. Uh, there we go. I've talked about this before. I'll talk about it now. It is quite sharp in the center. It radiates softness from there. It's a little fiddly to use. It's not a lens you're going to be able to focus quickly. So you will be doing more hyperfocal type of stuff with it or scale focusing, or zone focusing, whatever you want to call it, um, which you kind of have to do because it has so much depth of field anyway. Um, the other downside to this lens is since it's an odd filter size, any 34 you can't easily UV or polarize or ND or color filter if you're shooting monochrome. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, I'd probably go for, keep the close up, a 28 Elmerit, which I have somewhere. I'm doing great. Where'd my 28 Elmerit go? Hey, oh. Here it is. Okay. Oh. Got it. Okay. 28 Elmerit, which is probably, uh, there we go. Probably another one of those underrated lenses that. I like to, I always say the ones that are discontinued are underrated. But this is a current, current production. Don't be deceived by this lens. It looks much bigger than it is because the hood is obnoxiously large. Take, I actually never use this with the hood attached. If you put it next to the Sumeron, it's not, let me see, I can't even grab this lens. It's not that much bigger. And because the Sumeron is brass, the weights are almost the same. But of course, it's an E39 filter size, so you can filter it with a regular filter. It's considerably sharper in the corners. It's very high contrast, very well suited to the monochrome. My logic behind the 20 Elmerit is very similar to my logic amongst 50 shooters. They'll have a Noctilux and a 50 Sumacron. You have your unbelievable, magical, expensive, super, super lens, in this case, a 28 Sumilux, let's say. But you're not going to use that lens every day. Maybe it's just too big, too expensive, whatever. The 28 Elmerit, if you like the 28 focal length a lot, is an excellent partner to the 28 Sumilux because it is so small, it's extremely sharp, and very high contrast. 
This is especially fun on an M9, actually. I don't know why it looks so cool on an M9, but it is fun. But I was shooting with this on the M10 Monochrome for some testing maybe a month ago, and I was pleasantly surprised with how it rendered wide open, even though it's a 2.8, and not a 1.4. So for compactness, and you can't get a Sumerit 35 anymore because they don't make them, although we're going to try to fix that one day. Um, oh, we should mention that. We will uh, yeah. in a second. I'm going to talk about it. But 20 Elmerit version 2, sweet. I just, well, I'll talk about the Sumerits now, I guess. So if you've watched, again, any of these episodes, David and I, mostly me, go on and on and on about the F2.4 Sumerit lenses. I'm a big fan too. We agree on this one. Okay, we do. That Leica discontinued. We are actually starting a petition to con try to convince Leica to bring the Sumerit 2.4s back. Is there a link in the description? Not yet. We will put it in there. <laughs> if not, you'll find it somewhere. I don't know. We'll put it somewhere. Uh, maybe we can drop um, it in. Yeah, David, maybe you can pick it up. But anyway... We are starting a petition here at Red Dot Forum Camera Talk to petition like a camera, AG, to restart production of the 2.4 Sumer lenses. We love them. I think a lot of people like them. They were underappreciated in their time. I think now they are starting to get some traction. So David will find a link to that somewhere. I, I'm typing. Oh, he's putting it in the chat. He's just typing it letter by letter. Uh, <laughs> where you can, if you feel so compelled and are interested in have this, having the Sumerites come back into production, please sign our petition. It's just something fun. So anyway, uh, 20 Elmerit. My dog is growling in his sleep. Oh, um, this is the smallest current production M lens aside from the Sumeron. Let me make sure that actually works. Does it work? <laughs> okay, checking. We're, checking, we're checking the link. Um, do, 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 do. But yes, don't use the hood with the 28 Elmerit because, well, you know, you can, but it just makes the lens so much bigger. To me, it takes away from what makes that lens so special, which is the small size. Where did I get the cap from? Here we go. Um, Jose, give me another question. We got David sure. working on the link. Are lenses longer than 50 millimeter viable for street shooting? Well, that's a good question. I think so. I think especially if you're shy and you don't want to approach people or you want the compression that a long lens offers. I've used a 75 walking around doing street photography before. It's slower, so you may miss more moments than you would with a 35 or a 28, and you can't don't focus with it or scale focus because it just has too little depth of field, even at f8. But I think for street portraits or just for shooting something across the street and you want that extra reach, I don't have a problem with that. You do have to be aware, of course, of the shutter speed requirements. As you get longer, the handhold ability decreases. So if it's nighttime, you got to boost your ISO. But again, like I talked about earlier, because the high ISO performance of these cameras is so good, I can go out at night with a 75 or a 90, even a 90 Elmerit or a 90 Sumerit or a a 90 Elmar macro F4 with a 246 monochrome with an M10R, shoot an ISO 10,000 at F4 and get very usable images at shutter speeds that are more than adequate for hand holding a 90. So, food for thought. Did it work? Mm. Oh, he's working on it. Give me another question, Jose. Sure. No, I'll, I'll add it later. Uh, <laughs> okay. In fact, I'm going to delete this one because it is no good. Okay. All right. Can I use an SL for travel photography or is it too big? Well, I guess an SL2 or an SL oh. in this case. To use an SL2 for travel? Yes. Uh, I have. But, oh, my. but I, I think what's interesting here is I showed you kind of what I would take on an M, right? So an M with five lenses. Well, I can cover that same range from 24 to 90 with, oh, I don't know, maybe a 24 to 90. So having one camera and one lens and no bag can actually be smaller and lighter overall as a kit than having, say, an M10 and a 24 and a 35 and a 50 and a 90. And I have it all in one, one go. So I know people will say, but it's so big, it's so heavy. It's still smaller than carrying all the other stuff. A smaller total. Granted, it's bigger in the it's hand. It's in one piece, right. Yeah, so we're, but we're not, and I'm not saying that this is, or we're not saying this is a replacement for an M and five lenses, but this is a different no, approach. It is, and I've, I've taken both approaches. You know, I have shot with M, and I've shot with SL. Um, in fact, I covered the same documentary event. Um, I did the State Fair in Ohio for, for a photojournalism workshop, and I used an M10 and a bunch of lenses, and then I did it, another time and i took just an sl and 24 to 90 kind of as an experiment can i shoot documentary pj reportage with this kind of camera versus an m camera and the answer is yes the pictures were a little bit different in terms of 
what I'd frame up or what I was looking for. But ultimately, I, you know, I'm very happy with both outcomes. So I would be, I would be equally happy to shoot with either. We should also mention if you are looking for some inspiration in street photography or photography in general, there's two things that I want to talk about real quick. Mm -hmm. One is photo books. We've talked about a few over the year that we've done this show. Um, these are two that I grabbed this morning that I really like personally. One is American Color 2 by Konstantin Manos, who's a legendary street photographer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's insane. And the other is All That Life Can Afford by Matt Stewart, who's put that down. Another fantastic street photographer, a lot of really amusing moments. It's a and, lot of humor. And the, this is the kind of work that you can look at and know that it's attainable with work. It's not something so outlandish or exotic that you feel like you can't do it yourself, but but also, the... I also mentioned uh, a friend. A friend of Red Dot Forum is uh, Craig Semeco. Oh, of course, and, Craig is and the Craig man. is also always looks for the humor in in street photography. So and both these guys should like it. So the yeah. other uh, thing I want to talk about is, which is now I guess virtual. Mm -hmm. Every year here in Miami, for the past forever, we've had the Miami Street seven years now, I think. At least, yeah, seven, yeah. The Miami Street Photography Festival mm -hmm. (MSPF), which is an incredible organization, incredible event that brings together high profile photographers, um, we're involved, they have workshops, uh, contests, gallery, and tons mm -hmm. of stuff. I don't think we have a link to it in the description. We should put one in there, but they are doing programming this year. I think it's mspf.org or Miami Street Photography. I don't know it's mspf.org. Yeah, there it is. Um, check them out since virtual program is, is accessible anywhere. Um, they are a fantastic organization that I can highly recommend. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to throw out a shout out to MSPF while we're talking about normally. Normally, it takes place the first week of December in Miami, downtown yeah. Miami, but not this year. Now it's going to be virtual, but I think it's still going to be interesting. You should really support them. Uh, we've been, I guess, sponsors from the very beginning, and have supported that organization because it's photography in our backyard. And what's not to like about yeah, that? Yeah, very cool. All right, I know it's getting late, but we really should answer some more questions. Well, we kind of um, have a gap, so I think we're going to make a little exception. I agree, and I'm, I'm fine with that. So okay. let's, um, well, so, at least Theo Jose has found something before you go, because he's deeper. There, there's a couple comments about the SL with the 24 to 9 that I'm okay. just going to quickly, yeah, yeah. quickly hit on. Do it. Uh, Jeff says, Steve McCurry has been using an SL2 with the 24 to 90. Well, there you go. Sure. I mean, I don't doubt that. And he's pretty old, and he can handle it, so... <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> He's been around a long time. He's venerable. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he can do it, anybody can. All right. Uh, Robert says, David, with the 24 to 90, aren't you limited to F2.8? Well, yeah, 2.8 at the wide end to F4 at the long end. Uh, our loss of subject isolation, like I said, no. different. Yeah. Um, but I can actually focus closer with this lens than I can with an M lens. So I can make up for a little bit of the aperture difference by getting closer to my subject and still blow out the background. It, it People are actually really shocked. Uh, pictures that I've showed them from the 24 to 90 at 90. Oh, it's, it's not mspf.org I'm being yelled oh, at. What is it? it is Miami Street Photography Festival.org. Oh, Spell that. my bad. Sorry, MSPF. It's Miami Street Photography Festival.org. We love them. I have to shout them out. That's it. Sorry. Carry okay. On. It's just, I, they just use MSPF on the t-shirts, I guess. I know. They okay. threw me off. Even though Julie told me exactly what to say, and I totally ignored her. Sorry I'm, about that, I'm guys. A, I'm a okay. terrible person. So, so, yeah. People are amazed. At 90, at f4, it does not look like... I mean, it, it looks like a wider aperture lens. Because you can get so close, the reproduction ratio on all the SL lenses is, is pretty high. Even though it's not a macro, you can kind of pseudo-macro it. So, um, so I, I do find the, the 24 to 90 to be really um, actually quite flexible. Yeah, David has enough experience with the 24 to 90 now. I mean, so do I, but in terms of these alternative situations where he's brought it in where he may normally bring an M, and we've kind of figured out how flexible this lens actually is. We talk about it in high regard quite a lot, not just for fun, but because we actually use it. Um, let's keep going, Dave. We have a lot of questions. Yes. Uh, Go back to the chat, please. Not time for images right now. We really have to get to more questions. Let's see. We have one from Marlon that just Thank came you. in. Okay, go ahead. Here we go. I recently purchased a used 24 millimeter L Merit 2.8. It came with a size viewfinder for 25, 28 millimeter. Will I be okay shooting with a Leica MP and will the Leica Visiflex Type 020 work with a 24 millimeter on an M10? Uh, well, if the question is, well, okay. So the widest frame lines, 
you get on an M camera, modern M camera is 28. So if you want to shoot with a 24 and compose accurately, you either need an optical 24 finder or an electronic finder. So if you've got the VisaFlex on an M10 or the EVF2 on an M240, yeah, it's going to work perfectly. You're going to be able to see exactly what the lens is showing you. Um, is that the question, Jose? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would, yeah. yeah, if you're using a lens wider than 28 and you want to compose and focus, but mostly compose uh, very precisely, some kind of a, um, additional viewfinder is required. You can use the entire viewfinder. If you wear glasses like I do, you're never going to see it. No. It's so I always use an external finder, either optical on analog or electronic on an M10 or a 240. Mm -hmm. What's next? All right. What are your thoughts on color versus black and white for street photography? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You should definitely use one of those. Um, well, it, it's interesting, Joe. Josh brought up Costamanos, Costamanos, um, and that book is American Color 2. Now, what's interesting about Costa is that he started his career shooting exclusively in black and white. And around 1980, 1981, as he says, he had taken everything that he thought he could take in black and white. <laughs> He's been around a long time, this man. He is a legend. It's like, a okay. Legend. He's like, so I decided I'm going to shoot color. And he became one of the preeminent color street photographers because prior to that, I mean, if you think about like um, some of the more notable street photographers over time had all shot in black and white. And he had shot in black and white. And then he's like color and shot Kodachrome, like super rich, saturated color. And that's that's his second book on color street photography. So here's someone who's kind of been down both both approaches and he's become very much a color person. Mm -hmm. And someone like uh, like Alex Webb, who's also a Magnum photographer, has always been shooting really saturated color photography. And for a project he did called Lost City, which is about sort of the demise of Kodak in Rochester, New York, it was shot in black and white because kind of metaphorically the loss of color and all that. So I think both can be really effective. Um, I love color, but in a really busy environment, you know, on a street with a lot of different distractions and color, black and white can really focus your composition and eliminate a lot of visual noise and, and you're focusing on light, shadow, subject, you know, foreground, background, and that's it. So, there you go. Both. Good answer. Both. What's next? Any anything from the chat? Yeah, let's see. Curious to know, when do you like to gear up versus gear down for street photography? Um, I don't know if I ever think about it like that. I just really try to bring the right tools for the job based on the results I'm looking to get. There are certainly times where I'm going to bring a camera and a lens with no bag. That's especially true if I'm going to be out for a really long day and maybe I don't want to have a bag with me or I'm trying to be as discreet as possible. You know, a camera bag is usually a giveaway, whereas a camera, you can kind of tuck it under your arm. But I pretty much always have at least a Bowery with me, you know, a small owner bag with some lenses in it. Really, for street and travel photography, it's a very similar kit. When you, when you tune in in two weeks and see our landscape kits, it's only gearing up. There is no gearing down. It's yeah. insane. But for... Street and travel is just a, a pretty minimal kit. I think David's five lens setup in the uh, Harry and Sally bag was really, really representative of the maximum mm -hmm. that we would bring out. And I really wouldn't go much slimmer than two lenses. Again, unless I'm just going to go bagless and have one lens and then a battery or two Look, in my pocket. I've gone out, you know, certainly like we've gone to events and things and I'll just carry you know, an M and a 35 one four, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And nothing, and cause I'm wearing a suit. Like I'm not going to carry a bag. Um, I might carry an extra battery in a pocket and that's yeah. it. Yeah. And that's geared down. Um, but for the most part, if I'm purposely going out to photograph again, I would rather have it and not use it than need it and not have it. Especially yeah. when the stuff is small and light. I, I, there's no reason for me to leave it behind. What else we got Jose? Would you recommend using a VisaFlex on an M camera when shooting street photography? Probably not. I mean, well, it depends. So the VisaFlex is allowing you to focus and compose more accurately because you are seeing a live feed through the lens, but it does slow you down because of that um, 
I don't know how to say this the right way, but because of the nature of it, because it is requiring you to work slower to focus more precisely, it will slow you down unless you get really good at it, which I'm not uh, in the street. I think street photography is more about capturing those moments. And I talked about this earlier where supercritical focus or composition is not nearly as important as the moment itself. So I don't know. I probably wouldn't use one all the time. I, I, I always have one in the bag. They don't take up a lot of space, but I don't think I would use it for real serious 28 millimeter, 35 millimeter or whatever street shooting. What do you think? <laughs> That's the shrug. Know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to get this man a Gatorade or no, something. No, no, no. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I, I, the reality is that anything on this table we can make work for this kind of photography. Sure. Oh, right. Yeah. We can use a Polaroid camera. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a matter, it's going to, I, I always keep coming back to, you know, use what you're comfortable with, use what makes you happy to use, you know. And well, kind of, I, I don't I don't know if I agree with that because sometimes you using want to be something unhappy? no well <laughs> sometimes using something you're not comfortable with will give you results that you're happy with. That's true. Working outside your comfort zone. Absolutely. So there's there's two schools of thought here. It also is going to depend on the seriousness of your endeavor. Um, but I often encourage people that I engage with who are looking to be inspired or get out and shoot to do, to do something they normally wouldn't do. If they say, well, I've got a 3514 and I love it. I say, well, go out and get a 90 or get a 16, 18, 21 mm -hmm. or something totally that you'd never expect and see what you can do. This is especially helpful if you're photographing in an area you frequent, whether it's your downtown, your local downtown or a place you travel to or around your neighborhood, whatever. If you find yourself getting bored or getting tired of the same scenery, but maybe you can't travel or don't want to travel or you have a lot of work, whatever, using something out of your comfort zone, whether it's monochrome camera or a telephoto lens or whatever, will encourage you to see things a little differently without having to go somewhere exotic. And I think you may be surprised. At first, you may struggle and you may come out with nothing. But I guarantee you, if you work at it, you'll actually be surprised with not only the pictures you get, but how you're seeing something you look at maybe every day in a different light. No I like it. that. No pun intended. I mean, I do this myself. I went on a short trip way back in earlier this year in early March, and all I brought was the SL2 and the 90 Sumalux. That was it. I didn't bring any other lenses. It was a three-day trip. I drove there. I knew <laughs> that I wanted to think differently and see differently. I don't usually shoot 90 on the SL2, um, and I loved it. I shot um, wow. a polo match with that. And I got about three in focus pictures. They were really, really cool. There you go. <laughs> and I think I taped it wide open at 1.5. And I was oh, like, that's man. it. Yeah. It was great. I had a blast. And um, I got a few pictures I really liked. I took a portrait of some friends that were there. And I went out to the beach and photographed some dogs running around and all kinds of stuff. And it was awesome. So I would encourage you to think outside the box a little bit um, with your gear. That was a long answer. Yeah. For what sure. else? What about using teal lenses on the SL2? You can. Yeah, I mean, that was my last trip. Like I mentioned earlier, um, I was to the West Coast over the summer. I took SL2, 35.14 TL, 60 macro TL. Because you get autofocus, you get electronic aperture control. They're incredibly sharp. 20 megapixels for my needs when I'm traveling is often enough if it's just casual or stuff. I don't even go small um, with that. So I do it a lot, more often than people may realize. And we talked about this before. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. But I think we talked about it in the L-mount. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, because look at that. Yeah, give me a close-up of that, Jose. This is the 18 Almerit TL on an SL2. So it's a 20 megapixel 28. Done. Autofocus, same out, no adapter needed. So cool. Image stabilized. Yeah. Yeah. Stabilized. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fun. So if you own an SL2 and you own TL lenses, then you should try it. You're not, you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't tried it yet. But thanks. Let's do like 10 more minutes. Maybe more. <laughs> Let's see. I want to give the people the time they deserve. All right. No more solar flares. No more solar flares, right. I'm thinking about getting a seal for travel. Should I start with the 18 millimeter prime or the 18 to 56 zoom? Ooh, David, you got this one. Um, absolutely. You definitely should. Mm -hmm. uh, so the very first TL lens I used was back when the, the T701 came out, the original T. Uh, and I was the 18, 18 to 56. I found it to be an incredibly flexible, capable lens. I mean, I was really impressed with 
you know, at the widest end at 18, it was, it's really good. Um, and all through the range and it focuses nice and close, small, light, um, it's a good lens. But then I discovered just how compact the 18 is and a little bit faster in terms of the aperture, but really mainly for me, it's that compactness. And also just optically, it's a really nice lens. Um, so I kind of fell in love with this. And also along the way, I fell in love with the lens that's on my CL right now, which is this- uh, Tilt it a little bit there, there you go. The 35 one four. A little soft. There you, there you go, go. Nice. the 35 one four. And yeah, it's a little chewed up, but I use this lens probably the most of any of the CL lenses. And sometimes I'll just travel with, with these two. I'll travel with the 35 and the 18. I'm going to interject for a second and say that, to me, the 18 Elmeret specifically makes the CL and the TL2 a different camera mm -hmm. because they become pocketable. They become a camera you can hold. I'm going to actually, uh, where's the TL2? Here's the, the TL2. TL2. So if I have a TL2 and the 18, here we go. Imagine this with a wrist strap. This camera, I can hold it in my, the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. There's no other lens that allows me to have this type of discrete nature where it's light, it's compact, it will fit in a coat pocket, it'll fit in a very, very, very small camera bag. I mean, this is the same space as like a laptop charger takes up. So- Got a silver battery in there. And a silver, that's <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny. Nice, I love it. Um, but you know, the 18 to me is not just a cool compact 28, but it makes the camera pocketable. So it's really changing the dynamic nature of what the TL2 or the CL can do, mm -hmm. in addition to being a very nice little 28. So. The 18 to 56 is fantastically flexible, very high quality. And the reality is there's, since it's been out since the original T, there it's probably the most produced yeah. of all the TL mount lenses, which means there's used ones out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you buy a TL2 starter bundle or CL starter bundle with the 18, then you go out and you find the used 18 to 56 and you've got both. That's like the dream kit for me. Cause then you've got your, your wrist strap lens, that keeps it super, super small. And then you've got your zoom lens where you can be out and be flexible and get whatever you want. Yeah. That's that's my longer answer to that question. Good strategy. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I went out for a while. <laughs> uh, no, the 75 1.25 Noctilux, it's not what I would call a travel lens. Um, it is an amazing lens, but it's not necessarily a travel lens. Well, you could travel with anything, but it's uh, it's that lens is a deliberate lens. It's a lens that you're not going to shoot casually. Same thing with the 90 Sumo Lux or the 50 Noctilux. So usually I think of travel as a little more casual, a little more snapshotty, even if you're serious about it. And the 75 Noctilux is amazing and I love it, but I'm not gonna like, if I'm only bringing two lenses and I'm going to Paris, I'm probably not gonna bring a 75 Noctilux. Right, right. Because of the size and weight is yeah. a little bit tricky. What else? Although I know people who travel just with an M and a Noctilux 50. Yeah, the 50 Noctilux. I mean, look, I said I went on a trip with the SL2 and the 90 yeah. Lux. Because you're crazy. Because I'm crazy. And it was fun. But I think on average for the average individual, that's probably more exception than the rule. Jose, what do we got? Any tips to get inspired for photographing in my hometown when travel is difficult? Well, I think I talked about that already. Mm -hmm. um, using a different piece of gear either a lens you're not used to or shooting a black and white if you're shooting color or vice versa. The goal is to use the tools you have available in ways that you may have not thought about it. You know, you could take your lens and put it at minimum focus distance and don't move it from minimum focus for a whole day <laughs> and just shoot in focus images at minimum distance for all day. Force yourself to think at two feet or whatever. I mean, or, is. I mean, I've seen this experiment too. Force yourself to go out with only a 21. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. And, or, or, um, I did a great exercise when I was in college, which is like, they call it the corners exercise where mm -hmm. we had, I think it was the 1635 or something on a cannon body. Yeah. And you weren't allowed to have empty corners. Oh, like you had to have <laughs> something in all four corners. So it with, forced with that you, wide lens? Yeah. And it forced oh, you gosh. to think about framing. Oh, wow. And it forced you to utilize every square inch of the frame you have wow. available to you. So that was torture, uh, but it was fun because you're like trying to you find know, things to do. You, you can think of these, like any other skill, let's say that, you know, you're, you're into golf. Okay. There is golf drills that you can do to practice, you know, improving your swing or improving your chip shot or whatever it is. 
Uh, think about things like this. It sounds uh, completely absurd, some of the things we're talking about. Going out <laughs> only with a 21. Yeah. Or, and spending an entire day shooting with just a 21. Or filling the corners, you know, or yeah. shooting at minimum distance. Yeah. Think of them as, as drills to get good at a particular skill so that when you encounter that situation, it's automatic. Yeah. You know, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to be like, oh my gosh, what am I, how am I going to compose the shot? Yeah. Because it's, it's so wide, everything's far away. Because you now know how to approach that kind of situation, work that scene, and you have that comfort level. Yeah. I think photographers that have been shooting a lot, I mean, just regularly, all the time, you know, what, whether it's travel or street, whether it's landscape, whether it's portraits, they've encountered all of those situations just because they shoot so much. And that's why, you know, a really good experienced photographer is able to handle whatever situation they come into because they've seen it all before. But if you haven't seen it and you're looking to train yourself, especially in your backyard, where let's say, you know, things might be more limited than if you could go, you know, across the world and, and be in these exotic places that you're unfamiliar with. You can make yourself unfamiliar mm -hmm. and push yourself outside of that zone and then practice those skills that you can then put into practice yep. when you're when you're in that situation. Yeah, I mean, it's part of the fun, especially with digital photography, where there's no cost, no matter how many pictures you take, you can go to town and just shoot 5,000 images. And that's, mm -hmm. you, know, you gotta look through them all, but it's free to do so. Yeah. Good question though, what, how's the chat looking? Um, oh, someone says, uh, Leslie said, not someone, hey, Leslie. She said, uh, force yourself to shoot macro around your immediate environment. The 60 macro for the CL is amazing. Mm. We mm -hmm. would agree, mm -hmm. and we would agree. Um, mm -hmm. You can completely change your perspective if you have the perspective of an ant, right? Because if you are only seeing everything up close, you don't realize where you are. It takes you out of that place. So I think that's a great suggestion as well. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I love the 60 macro. I use it on the SL2. I'll, I'm not going to start talking about it again because I talk about it every episode, but <laughs> I do love it. Uh... What about a Ferris trap for traveling? Oh my goodness. Straps are like bags, right? There's an infinite number of straps. But they take up a lot less space. Um, I can I can run through a small selection, just a very small selection, because there's, again, just like bags, it's a very personal taste issue. Yeah, why don't we quickly... We're going to quickly get on if some, that's of, possible. some of the popular options. All right, and go. Okay. I think just as neat factor, this one is uh, cool. This one is Artisan and Artist. And it's um, this is an ACAM three one two. Yep, they're the gradient straps. They have that cool gradient finish on them. They're silk. Very very soft. Very pliable. This is a nice strap. You can wrap around your hand. Use it as like a wrist strap or a hand strap. Yeah, these are sweet. Uh, they, the blue I have a blue and silver one, which you probably yeah. Don't have, but that's I don't really have it, nice. but the blue and silver one's really nice. This accents the like a red dot really well. It does. Also. It does. Okay, what else? I'm going to stick on uh, Artisan and Artist here. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Okay, this is another. Ooh, this nice. is a popular Artisan and Artist one. This That's is actually the 306. I think it's a 306. Yeah, it's a 306. Yeah. It's an ACAM. Three, so all our artists' products are ACAM and then a number. So this is an ACAM so it's got, 306. Yep. So it's got the nice uh, leather ends with the protector. And this is a, a kind of a thin rope strap, silk rope strap. And I think Artisan might have been. Were they the first ones to do silk straps? Uh, silk I ropes? imagine this is Japanese silk. Yeah. And it's a little more pliable than the cotton rope straps. Yeah. So you can see I, I, yeah. it's an easy wrap situation. Yeah. This is sweet. What's really nice about some a lot of the straps I'm showing you, and when we talk about wrapping, so I use this strap, which is um, an E25 artisan strap. This is also you made can't get the this same. color anymore. I'm sorry. I know, but I, I don't want to hear it. it. <laughs> I have it. Okay. So this is what's on my camera here. And... It's not as good for wrapping as you can see because it's huge. Um, so I use this because I, I can easily adjust it. Um, let's see if we get a close-up. Yeah, so this is the ACAM E25R. They do make it in other colors, just not the khaki finish anymore. Right. So I'm able to quickly adjust the length using this um, little release thing here. It's pretty cool. It is. Uh, not, this is not a very compact strap. So if, no. you're, if you're building a really minimal kit, Go with like a 312 like we just showed because this takes up right. a lot more space in the bag. Right. Um, so what I want to show close up is yeah. let's say that you have this strap around your neck, but you can just quickly wrap it like this. And now you have a very secure way to hold. I'm just going to pretend it's attached to this. A very secure way to hold your camera as a, as a wrist strap. 
right? But when you want to carry it on your shoulder, you just give it a little unwind, and now it's now it's a shoulder neck strap. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the available color for the uh, E25. It only comes in this in this red color now. Oh, it looks orange on the feet. Uh, that's I don't know if that's oh, right or not. Okay. It's, well, it's if it looked orange on your, it's red. It's bright red. <laughs> I promise. Okay. Very strange. Um, so moving on, this is another rope strap. This is a from actually Leica. This is a Leica one, sort of. So you see Leica on this end. And then there's a Koof logo on that end, C-O-O-P-H. So this is the um, Koof for Leica rope strap, and it's thicker than the Artisan one. And some people just like this because for, especially if you have a little bit heavier camera, it spreads the weight a little bit more, but it's a bit less pliable, but you certainly can still wrap it around as a wrist strap. Yeah, this the cotton straps are nice because they do take the weight of a heavier setup. So yeah. if you're shooting with an Octolux or a larger lens, yeah, it's nice. Okay, what else, what else you got there? So lastly, I'm going to show you um, the strap. You know, I'm more a fan of this strap on a, on a larger camera, but people do use them on an M. Uh, I like this on the SL. This is actually the strap I use for the SL2. And this is a Peak Design Slide Light. Um, so it's got these really cool... Yeah, I said cool again. <laughs> <laughs> take, take a shot. Take a shot, guys. Oh, everyone watching is going to be wasted by the time this right. video is over. So what I like about this one, and I'm going to talk about this more in our landscape episode, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, but it has a quick quick release system where these stay on your camera. You actually loop them through like so, right? And then that's attached to your camera, and then you have a little end that can then quickly go into the into the peak strap here. Um I like it because it's it's wide. It's got a nice little anti-skid, which you can't even see, but it's rubberized right there. Um, very nice, smooth, uh, woven material. And like the smaller artisan strap, it also has a quick adjust where you unlock this, and then the strap can adjust in length, and then you lock it back down. So this is really good. Um, if you have an M, uh, this actually will work nicely for an M. But they do make a, a smaller version, which is called the... What is this called? The, this is, is this the leash? Uh, no, it's the slide light. No, that's the slide light. Mm, that's the slide. No, this is a different one. Oh, which one is that one? It's the other one. Oh, I can't keep track of all these model numbers. What do you want from me? Anyway, so, <laughs> I know all the lenses, okay? <laughs> is that so this is a much <laughs> narrower strap that you could use for a CL or a Q or an M. But it has the same attachment style. So let's say that you wanted a small strap one day um, and you wanted a heavier strap the next day. It's the exact same quick release piece for the camera, which is kind of neat. Um, so that's this one is also adjustable, but it is um, much, much smaller and lighter. And along that line, if you decide that for the day you want to go out with just a hand strap, again, it's that same uh, peak design quick release so you can quickly get from a neck strap to just a, a hand strap. This is called the cuff. Yeah, this I, is the cuff. I think I know this one, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. This is the this is the cuff and it's got a little metal adjustable piece here to to tension it up. And it's pretty nice because it gives you that extra length to to grip onto the camera. Uh, included with these, they also give you I don't know if I have it here. They also give you a little baggie with a piece that goes in the bottom of the camera for a to attach on the bot on the bottom. Yeah. I see Enzo has repositioned himself right under your feet. A little bit. Hey, everybody wants to see him, but he's like passed out under the table. So I'm yeah, sorry. there are well the last one I want to show real quick. I only have one here is just another style. This is the Arte de Mano. They make a bunch of straps, 99% of which are out of stock right now because they're just hard to get. This is the Komodo style strap. It is just very simple, flat, thin leather strap. This one is very well used. It is super pliable. I, um, I like the strap because it just wraps around the lens really well. It stays small in a bag. But if you mm -hmm. like a leather strap as opposed to, you know, the materials David yep. showed, the nylon. This yeah. is a good option. That is yep. the classic neck strap, which is basically it's exactly the same. The Komodo strap. strap with a sort of movable shoulder pad on it. Um, so if you want something leather, Arte de Mano is as good as it gets. Okay. So it's getting. We, 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 we gotta. We gotta yeah. wrap it up. Um, any other burning, burning questions, Jose, that we need to address or David, as you're looking in the chat, um, I think we've done a pretty good job filling in the yeah. time that we lost from the meteor strikes and solar flares. 
Yeah, I mean, we had a, if you can pick um, between the M10R with a 28 millimeter or a Q2. Well, that's a good question to end on. Mm. Let's, so, let, let's, so the question is. M10, M10R in this case, but. Who asked this M10, question? Um, I know Mike asked this question. Well, you know, <laughs> like, Mike asked this question. I saw this earlier. I'm going to ask it to you, David. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pose it. M10R plus yeah. 28 Sumalux or Q2 with its own 28 Sumalux. Go. That is a tough call. Mm. That is a really tough call because both are outstanding quality and really represent some of the best possible image quality available in Leica today, for, especially for that focal length. So the Q2 has the same basic sensor as the SL2, which is you know, top of the line. Um, and it's paired with a 28 Simulox lens that is also the best in the range. I mean, it's it's at least as good as the 28 Sumalux M lens, which is what we're comparing it to here. So it is no worse of a lens than the M lens. But I will say that the Q has a few advantages. So I'm going to kind of give the Q section first. One, it has a built-in EVF, which keeps everything compact if you want to use EVF. And it's a better EVF. It's a 3.8 megapixel OLED. The camera also is weather sealed, which the M10R is, but not the lenses. So the entire Q2 is completely uh, moisture and dust sealed, which is very nice for traveling around and if you get caught in a downpour. Um, also, it has a macro mode, which we love because it's so satisfying to just you know, get a close-up of that. Um, yeah, you we, we probably should talk about yeah. this at length in the Q episode. Yeah, but I'm just going to do that. So that's the macro mode, which obviously the M lens does not have. Okay, so those are all well, my... Well, you missed the big one, which is the Q2 is autofocus. And the Q2 is auto. <laughs> That's a big one. Of course. The yeah. Q2 is autofocus, which means you can hand it to a stranger and you can get a picture of yourself. Um, <laughs> it's not the case with M because you're not going to give someone a whole lesson in rangefinder photography unless you happen to run into that other person where they're also an M photographer, which happens sometimes. Yeah. Okay, now let's switch over to the M10R. Now, the M10R is going to offer you better low-light performance because it has a dual-gain uh, ISO structure on the sensor. It's probably going to be two stops better for high ISO performance. Uh, it also has more dynamic range, especially in the highlights and in the shadows. So you'll probably get one and a half more stops of dynamic range on the M10R. And obviously, it's an M, so you get the advantages of a rangefinder, which means you can see outside of your frame lines, you can predict movement coming in. It's very discreet. Um, low light is not an issue because you don't have to worry about this, the image gaining up in the viewfinder. You're looking optically through it, which is great. And the biggest advantage for me is it has interchangeable lenses. So I can use a 28 Lux one day, but I can go and I can shoot a 50 Summicron, you know, a minute later. So I like that flexibility of being able to change lenses. Because like Josh said earlier, you can do digital cropping. You're not going to run out of megapixels, but you're not going to get the same look optically as you will if I put a 50 on than if you crop a 28 to a virtual 50. So they both, I think, are really good options. It just comes down to what your preferences are. And, and your budget, by the way. And your budget. It's true. That's another advantage for the Q2 because mm -hmm. the entire Q2 costs less than the 28 millimeter lens on the M system, let alone the camera. So you're looking at, what is this, less than half? Well, it's five grand versus 15. A third the price. Yeah. So the Q2 is pretty hard to beat. And I know, Josh, you have an yes. opinion on what you should do with the Q2 if you have an existing M kit. Well, the Q2 can, if you have an M kit already, the Q2 yeah. is your M28. What I mean is I'll go out with an M10R and a 50 Apo and a Q2 and that's my whole kit. I don't have any other M lenses because I have basically a 50 and 28 kit, but I also have two cameras that do two different things. So if I'm looking for the rangefinder experience and the 50, the true 50 millimeter experience, M10R. If I'm need uh, in need of autofocus, shooting something fast moving, or in need of macro, or I need a 28, I pull the Q2. So the Q2 is actually a really nice companion to the M. Um, or as was David would say, mm -hmm. I want someone to take my picture or if I'm with family and they're going to take a picture. So I think between the two, between M10R and 28 Lux or Q2, 
Hey, if it broke it down, I couldn't. Do, I can't do any better than that. I mean, and, and the Q2 does have uh, image stabilization as well. That's true. Although but you can hold, my, you can hand hold an M pretty darn steadily. You can. Um, I think it's flexibility and expandability versus compactness and speed is kind of if I was going to sum it up. I'd agree. Um, I'd have to have both, obviously, but <laughs> in Clearly. a perfect world. Weather I think the ceiling Q is important. The weather, the weather ceiling, yeah. So the Q2 is an incredibly powerful. And you know what? The original Q is no slouch great. either. Right. Because it's the same lens on the Q and the Q2. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would happily get an M10R and a 50 Apo. And let's say I didn't have another five grand in the budget. I'd spend 25 to 2800 mm. get a used Q. Spectacular image quality. Still super fast. Still has Wi-Fi. Still has a good EVF. And I'm good to go. Whew. We have wow. to end on that. There's nothing else we can talk about. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's so late. All right. Uh, well, first, oh, before oh. David closes up, yep. um, I do want to say thank you for putting up with our technical difficulties. We don't really oh. know what it was that was causing all these problems. Um, you know, we try extremely hard to, you know, if you could see what David does to maintain the standards we have here in the studio, you would probably freak out. But weird things happen. Um, but we're still here, and we're still going to be here in two weeks, and two weeks after that, and two weeks after that. So thank you for tolerating that. We appreciate it. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, yeah, what Josh said. I very sorry about the the technical challenges we seem to be uh, recurring uh, here. Who knows? Software, hardware, internet, YouTube. You know, you know, gremlins. Gremlins. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll have it all sorted out by our next episode. And uh, we will have smooth sailing after this because I'm very excited for our next episode to talk about gearing up for landscape photography because it is so much gear, so much gear. Uh, so I love going over all this and trying to break down all the things that um, that I've learned over my many, many outings into, <laughs> into the wild world uh, of landscape photography. And hopefully being able to distill some of our experience and knowledge and help you guys out where you don't have to make the same missteps that we've made along the way because believe me we did not start out perfect <laughs> we did not go perfectly yeah. this you know it has taken us many years to find the things that work the best and we're still figuring out stuff every day that's the fun right is we're constantly pushing and trying new things and and, and you yeah. can see how excited Josh gets when he discovers something new. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, man. this thing, you got to check you it gotta out. You got to have this tiny little thingy, but it'll yeah. change your life. It'll change your life. I'm just saying. You so know. so we're very excited about that. And um, also we're going to be showing some sort of cool thing, a new, uh, new product to the market, kind of a first look. It's not anywhere else, um, a new tripod system. And I actually have been playing with it but uh, no one else has seen it yet, so we're gonna show it here on the uh, yep. on the camera talk. It's gonna so be sweet, tune in, tune in for that, and we'll have much bigger bags that will block our faces mm -hmm. next time, and bigger tripods and bigger everything. So that's gonna be, uh, I think, an exciting episode to tune in. Thank you again to Josh, to Jose, to all of you who were patient and stuck with us during uh, the craziness tonight and uh, have stuck with us for now 21 episodes. We truly appreciate it. If you guys are not already subscribed to Red Dot Forum YouTube channel, please click the subscribe button below. Give us a thumbs up if you have pity for us <laughs> and um, thumbs down if you have no pity, but uh, we'll take whatever it gets. Also, be sure to leave comments. If we weren't able to address questions that you had with regards to travel and street, we're happy to hit you up uh, in the comments section. I'll be monitoring that through the week. Um, always want to do that. Make sure to check out the links. Check out red.forum.com. And I think that's going to do it for us until our next episode. So thank you and good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, guys. Good night.